Let's rock and roll, dude. Oh my. <laughs> the, wrong the nerves are getting to him. What do you got in the other cup? Water. Yeah, water. right. <laughs> you got a little liquid courage in that cup, dude. Uh, All right, let's rock and roll. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Just a Taste. And today, ladies, gentlemen, we have a special episode for you. A little taste of the plumbing world. We have our first guest of the podcast on. Let us introduce Mr. Matt Woodcraft. Hold your applause, please. Which is <laughs> my boss, I guess, <laughs> technically. So this will be interesting. We'll see how it goes. I might get fired depending on what we say, but Matt, welcome. Thanks Thank for you. having us on. Thank you. Um, Doss bailed again tonight doing beans. So now we're going to get into the world of plumbing, I guess, a little bit. I don't know. So here's kind of my layout, I guess, for this segment episode is more interview style. I ask you questions. I don't talk as much, which will be weird. Um, <laughs> that probably won't happen. I'll still probably talk a lot. But we have Matt. If you don't know the company I work for, GH Mechanical, we merged with him, what? April 1st, officially. April 1st. So he had his own company, Life Flow Plumbing, came on board with us. Um but in the realm of that, he had his own business for how many years did you have your own business for? May would have been 10 years. 10 just years. Shy nine, uh, just shy of 10 years. One full decade. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So with that, what was, uh, what's like your origin story? What's your villain origin story? Villain like, origin with, story. Like how'd you get into, I don't know, people ask me how I got into plumbing and I was just a broke college kid and I needed money. Like, was that kind of a similar story for you or were you like plunging a tard one day and just like, hey, I could, I could, I could do this for I money? I could do this full time. Well, uh, what do we got there? No, I would say, so I knew I wanted to work with my hands. Um, I enjoyed working with my hands. I thought I wanted to get into carpentry, mm. um, like woodworking. Mm-hmm. I, I still enjoy woodworking, trim, cabinetry, that kind of thing. Um, so I went to Brownstown Votech. Did for, you? Yeah. CTC. Really? Yep. I went there too. Yep. My junior year, I did the half day program. Yep. So two, three hours a day. And that's what they call the construction cluster. And then you're in there and you take a couple months. I guess it was about a month per like uh, construction um, class. So you had masonry, electrical, mm-hmm. framing, uh, all that kind of stuff. And then I did plumbing, and I was like, ah, I actually kind of enjoy this. And then I was talking to the plumbing instructor, Mr. Gibble. Shout out, Mr. Gibble. Um, and he was like, oh, yeah, I find work for all my students, 90, I think he said like 90%. And literally the only ones he doesn't find work for are the ones that don't have driver's license. Ah. So get your driver's license, kids. <laughs> So uh, I was like, wow. And then I started thinking about it. I was like, well, I don't want to do framing because I'm in the elements. I'm building the yep. house that, you know, I want to get shel- be sheltered in. So I was like, plumbing plumbing would work, could work. Uh, it's probably some tight spots and some nasty work. Um, but, yeah, I could do it. So then uh, that was junior year. And then senior year went full time up to CTC. Is that and- still at the Brownstown campus? Yeah, still is. Yep. But then I was hired from by Haller Enterprise um, my s- summer of my junior year. So I kind of got a taste, mm-hmm. just a taste just of... A, <laughs> just a freaking taste of it. <laughs> just right in your mouth. I could do some... Yeah, okay. Um, uh, that summer, and it was hot, sticky, whatever, but I was like, yeah, I can still do this. So Were that, you doing, like, remodels? What were you doing with that? That was... So the summer, actually... The multi units there across from the library, like on the backside of the Effort Library, oh, and mm-hmm. across from um, GSM, whatever. Yeah, basically, it was there all summer. So really? we did new construction, uh, two story multi multi family homes, multi family buildings, okay. whatever. So yeah, literally was there from for slabs, for rough in, and some of finish, not a lot. Um, that was basically my whole summer, which is what. Nine weeks, 10, 12 weeks, something, yeah, like, something that. like that. So just there all summer long and then um, went back to Votech full time and then got hired by Haller my senior year there in the summer. And then um, I actually did advanced placement. Um, what, and, now, what does that mean? So advanced placement is, is that like you're on the spectrum a little or, <laughs> or like, like, 
you're you're smart or what 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 does that mean super special um no so you have the good grades um and keep up with all your what they call task work or basically book work okay um and it was task work hands-on work um if all that was up to snuff and up to par then you could be go to uh uh uh, an employer once a week Mm. for like I think it was like for two weeks, and then if that went well and they were good, they, they would just be up to two weeks, time. Uh, two days a week, and then eventually full weeks, and then you reported back to school every other Monday, and that could excuse me, that could start oh, as early. So you're only in school one day a week, then. Yep, one day a week, and that could start as early as February. Nice. So I was basically out working. So what is that? February, the, March, April, May, June, like five months. Yeah, out of five months year. of work. Dang. Started little by little and then building up, building up. And yeah. So that's what was uh what was your starting pay with them? Oh my word. Nine nine twenty five. Was that pretty decent for the time? It was. Yeah. I, I talked to some other buddies of mine and yeah. Eight fifty, nine, nine twenty five. That was about Oh yeah. Some other plumbing guy plumbing guys and then electrical. Yep, that was like you said, that wage. was pretty decent. So that's what we're paying at GH. So if you want a job, <laughs> nine twenty five. It's still above. Is minimum wage still seven twenty five? Did that get bumped up? I think it's eight fifty. Eight fifty. I think it's up now. I know bit. those Californians. Have been California, trying to, it's like they've been 50. trying to raise it up. But <laughs> interesting. So you went to the Votech. Went to Votech. Um, did you commute or you ride the bus? I biked. Junior. Okay, <laughs> you freaking whatever. Junior. Where'd Junior. you live? So at that time, we lived at um, Parkview Heights. Yeah, Parkview Heights Road, which is an Akron. Oh, kind of okay, so that's actually so not I that biked, far. No, I biked three miles one way. My junior year, then my senior year, I got my license yep. and drove. Halfway through my junior, I guess, end of junior year, beginning of senior year, I got my license and then drove. But yeah, no, I biked. You want to hear something like, crazy? I had my license, so I was the youngest... Like in my class, because I was right on the threshold where I would have been the oldest in the grade below me or the youngest in my grade. So I only got my license like in senior year or something. But then I bought a car, which is an RX-8. If you don't know anything about RX-8s, it's a rotary engine. And pretty, I don't even know what it means. It's Instead of pistons, it has a rotor that kind of spins around combustion. Oh, wow. But apparently, they those engines are known to have engine problems. If you don't drive them like a race car, they seize up. If you drive them for short distances, you need to like warm the engine up. So great for a sixteen year old kid because you literally had to be at like four thousand RPMs cruising speed. So you're always going fast. But <laughs> I had a car. I had a sweet like for high school. It was dope. That's like, a it Subaru, was, it right? Was, no, it's a Mazda. Uh, Mazda okay, RX-8. Okay. Got it. Um, like, it would have been a sick car to have in high school. And I didn't drive it to high school because my house was only a mile away. And, like, I took the bus every freaking day with having a car. <laughs> and I, I don't know. I was so mad. I was like, this is stupid. And then, like, one day I drove. I was like, why don't I do this more often? Anywho, that was a tangent. Um, <laughs> nothing really related on any of those spectrums. Um, she biked. Then you got your license. And my license and drove. What was your first car? Uh, Volkswagen Jetta. Black. Dude, classic. 900 bucks. <laughs> cash. Oh, yeah. Under the mattress. And it stalled out. <laughs> I bought it. My dad and I drove it to AutoZone. AutoZone in Ephrata? Advanced Auto in Ephrata? By Walba there. Went the parking lot. Or drove, parked in there. And it got like floor mats. Tight oh, steering yeah. wheel grip. Like I... Spoiler, hang <laughs> yeah, and Got then that. try pull it. I'll never forget this. Pulling out of the parking lot, I floored it, and the thing went <laughs> and just, just stalled out. Was it a uh, manual? No, was it, no, it wasn't manual. It was automatic. But I floored it halfway into the the lane, and it stalled out and freaked me out. <laughs> My dad's like, "Start it up, start it up! I can't, I can't." So I think we put it in neutral and pushed it back into oh, the dude. parking lot. And then it, I don't forget what happened. I think we eventually started it up, and then it was fine. But to this day, I hate flooring it to pull out just because of that. Like, yeah, and, and that was the only time I ever. That I remember ever doing it. It just I floored it. And that was the only time you floored your car. No, no, that was the only time oh, that car did that to me. I was going to say. I was like, yeah, no, what? I've floored it since. But ever since then, I, I'm very leery about flooring. Were you an aggressive driver? Did you speed a lot? No, no, I tried not to. Good for you, man. <laughs> Better man than me. I now, love speeding. Now, if I had a fast car, it might have been a lot harder. Like, 
Oh yeah, yeah a zippy car or a responsive, but my Jetta was not very responsive. Oh, that doesn't matter. Yeah. I had a Ford. So, well, my first car I bought was a Mazda, and I wrapped that around a tree doing like eighty. Um, but then I had a Ford Focus. I love Ford Focuses. Great little cars. They're trash, but you can just abuse them, and they just keep, keep taking running. it. <laughs> Me and my buddy. Like he had a well Dawson actually he had a Alero I think it's a Chevy Chevy Alero is that the sounds right anywho the thing was a sack of junk dude it had like different colored doors and side panels and everything <laughs> they were not fast cars but what we found out is if we raced in reverse it was infinitely more terrifying so we were on uh, I don't even know what road it is right off Brubaker Valley at our one buddy's house. And we're like, okay, yeah, let's just back up onto the road and drag race in reverse. My focus got up to 45 miles an hour in reverse, and it still had more to go. I was terrified because at 45, then your steering's in the back of the car if you're going to... Right. And like any little tweak, the whole car was like... Pfft. Absolutely what, terrifying, but... I what were the rules? Like, could you look Could you look back in yeah, the yeah, rear you view? you were just looking back and okay. just gunning it. Yeah. And his, his topped out at like 35, so it was... <laughs> I but smoked it, him, but it was so And the scary. sound, the... Oh, dude, like the it rear sounded like it was about to blow up. If you take like an F-22 and then knock it up like 17 octaves, that was the so, sound of my Ford Focus. Some Ford engineer right now is just like... Oh, yeah, but <laughs> anywho. Um, I also took that car... This is a random story, too. My brother and... Same farm, actually. <laughs> the same place we raced. I don't know why we did so much stupid stuff on that road. <laughs> my brother and his one buddy had... Uh, the one guy had a dirt bike and then my brother had a four-wheeler and I didn't have anything and I was bummed. They were ripping around in the field. So I was like, well, screw this. So I got in the Ford Focus and just started ripping through the fields. Doing like 65 through a field, just ripping the e-brake. And it just kept taking it. I love that car. It was so fun. Stick shift, blast of a car, but <laughs> then I think I... No, I didn't total that one. That one, I uh, I bought for like 2200 bucks, and it had like... 40,000, but this was before COVID. And then over COVID, no, this would have been a little before COVID. I sold it and the car market was crazy. I doubled my money on it. It was awesome. And nice. I, I drove it for like two and a half, three years. Nice. But I still wish I had that car back, but sad day. Wow. Anywho, that's yes. a random tangent for another time. No, that's fine. Um, what were we saying? Villain story. Senior year. Of Senior year. Yeah. Road got tech. working with Haller. Yep. 950 good pay honestly um still <laughs> hoping yeah Competitive. still still hoping for the day I get 950 <laughs> but uh so then when did did you transfer straight from Haller on your own in your own business yeah. yeah so I was at Haller then for five five and a half years and then got my journeyman's and then within a year after a year within six months actually probably I got got actually got married and then um, one year after I got married pretty much to the day 20 20 days short of my anniversary went on my own really yep so where was the uh, so with Haller you got your journeyman's did you have to do the night school yes Oh, yeah. I should back up. and Yeah. So the cool thing with uh, Brownstown is they do the ABC program, Associated Builders and Contractors. Oh, yeah. So they do that. The year, year, your senior year in Brownstown is year one for ABC. So then after ABC or after Brownstown, I went to Haller and then they um, compensated me basically for my school apprenticeship schooling at ABC. So, as so they paid for your schooling then? Not up front. I paid up front. But as long as I got straight A's, um, and it, it was basically what they did was after, so one calendar year after your first year, like if you started the year two, they compensated you for that first year. So mm. that way, and then after I graduated my fourth year, they waited, I think it was 90 days or a year, and then they compensated me from that year as long as you had A's, yeah. um, straight A's. And the reason they did that was just to keep guys on because guys would graduate and then leave to yep. go somewhere else because they could say, oh, um, I broke graduate ABC and you know, I'm going to another company and make more money. So then you had to wait, and it was like 700 bucks, I think, or something like that, which you know, for a young guy, it was that was a lot of money. Yeah, it's still a lot of money today. That's oh, like dude. two weeks, a month of groceries. Two, Heck yeah. Two weeks of groceries. Um, so yeah, 
then graduated there, uh, got my journeyman's, and then went on my own pretty much after that. And so you just used and abused them, and then <laughs> I, I love it. I, I love it. That no, is an I origin wanted story. To do, that's right. I forgot to mention. I wanted to do service, getting more in the service mm-hmm. plumbing, but they were like, "No, you know, we new construction's busy. We want to keep you there. You're trained there, yep. whatever." And a lot of the service guys were, you know, thir- 40, almost forty. I'd say early forties, late. 30s and up so experienced plumbers kind of maybe a little bit more easier on the body kind of work oh yeah so they didn't want a young 20 some old 20 some year old uh doing it but anyway so i was like well um i'd like to do that and um i'm talking to a bunch of other guys and several other electricians plumbers were like oh yeah i thought of going on my own but you know now i have a house and family Mm -hmm. and kids it's more risk and at back then we had a car payment and we were renting. Um, and I would told my wife, I'm like, I think it's like now or never. Yeah. Like if I do it now and fail, there's no, we, my wife worked full time. So it was like, why What'd not she do? Just, she worked at United Zion in the um, dietary. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. She worked up to, to management. She would help with kitchen stuff, um, waitering, um, yeah, clean up, that kind of thing. But, yeah, she worked up to management. When she left, she left to have landed our son, our firstborn, and they didn't want her to leave. They were offered her, like, I forget, 3 $4 pay raise, a whole Dang. bunch of other stuff. And, yeah, she said, nope, I'm going to raise my, my son, help my husband with his business. So that's what she ended up doing then, leaving that. And that was year three. I think it was year three or four of my business, something like that. Um so anyway, um, but yeah, so l- talking to other guys, other plumbers that wanted to possibly start their own, I was just like, well, it's now or never. Uh, in my opinion, it's now or never the least amount of risk that yeah. way if it failed. Um, and I tried to play it smart. We saved up, you know, like six months of living expenses. Um, and then I snowballed about a month's worth of side jobs mm-hmm. and just said, you know, like, hey, if you wait yeah. till April f- or May 1st, I'm going on my own. I can do. And so it's just been busy ever since. So, that- so then how did you get? those side jobs like were you scalping customers no no it <laughs> literally, it, be honest no, it oh it Haller's gonna be was, pissed well there was several guys at Haller that didn't do side work like okay. they just hated yeah. it they hated the split of evenings and weekends yep. so they were like hey woodcraft can do it woodcraft can do it so um i snowballed those but then word of mouth got around mm-hmm. um you know that friends and family and and um even customers that were like um, to, to like I said to guys at Haller or whatever. Yeah. Uh, my boss I think gave out my name to a couple people. Oh that, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it was That's actually nice. it was kind of nice. Some some small stuff that yeah. like was almost too small for Haller. They didn't want. Um. But and my boss was cool with it just as long as I wasn't competing with them with the mm-hmm. bigger jobs and yeah. like you know, they're losing to me and I wasn't interested in the bigger jobs anyway. So anyway, um. Yeah, and that's how it started. So I just snowballed a month's worth of work and. Just uh, left, you know, went on my own and started started work, and it was busy. Hmm. So with that, like, okay, so I had a moment. I don't know, maybe half a year. No, it would have been a, it would have been over a year ago, where the church I go to had a position for some sort of art director type deal, yeah. and I was seriously considering going to that job, and then things just like worked itself out that it fell through and then I just stayed at GH Mechanical but even in transitioning to that job the fear of missing out I don't know maybe I struggle with like crazy FOMO I don't really know to be honest but like I knew GH was in a spot where it's like okay they're gonna do awesome things but then also I was working in the field at that time and I didn't love what I was doing so it's like I was in that rock in a hard place type deal yeah. and dude that was one of the like weirdest I wouldn't say hardest but just weird decisions of my life even though I didn't even get the position sure but like what moving from security and now I guess I kind of feel like I'm dealing with that a little bit now so you have security which is your nine to five your hey steady paycheck every day or sorry every other week or every week however your pay schedule is but then you have the freedom of it's way more responsibility, way more risk, but you have the freedom of kind of taking your business to a level of what you want to do a little bit more. Right. Like with that, what was your thought process? Did you have like a lot of fear or anything like surrounding that where it's just like, oh, dang, like and I feel like even today, maybe it wasn't 
I feel like every time period is this pretty much the exact same. Like it's never the right time to do something. Right. You just kind of got to do it. Like yeah. I know even with talking with people, it's like, oh, 2018, I should have bought a house. And it's like, yeah, but in 2018, you were grumpy because the housing market sucked too. Right. So like right. it's always that. It's never that opportune time. But do you think like – in today's world now, everything, like, yeah, inflation's crazy, whatever the media wants to tell you there. Like, do you think there's differences or do you think if you would go out on your own today? Now, obviously, you today, but in your 20-year-old self. Right. Do you think there would be differences or do you think it would pretty much be the same? You think it would be like, like the, has times really changed or is it just kind of something you just got to do? Yeah, no, I think it's definitely something you got to do. If your if your heart is set on it and your mind is set on it, you will make it work. Mm -hmm. And you know, for my wife and I, it was well. What logically? How do we mitigate risk? How do we take a uh, like you were saying, um, uh, un unsure event from our security to our unsure event or un unsecurity and make it more secure or make it mm -hmm. um, you know pad and pad any uh, you know bumps in the road and so that's where we felt six months of of savings saved up and we weren't going to wait six months but like three months in if it's like hey think or two months in things are not working out the money whatever the profits the profit isn't working or whatever doesn't make sense then then we'll ban and ship and i even thought too like my boss said if you th you're always welcome back there will always be work here so i thought even now that i quote unquote quit i could come back yeah. as like a new position part-time mm -hmm two days a week, whatever, and make this side hustle work or the side service um, plumbing work. But then also, I think a big thing for me was just, and for men and for, for husbands, it's it's the, the security in work. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I felt like snowballing that yeah, that's uh, smart. one month of, of, of service calls, or I'm sorry, of plumbing. And it wasn't like... I had four or five jobs in a day. It was like, okay, I get one job this day, one job that day. And, you know, a month is you know what is that 25 working days 22 working days depending yeah, on you know whatever like that. so plenty of working days and i was getting two to three uh yeah i'd say two to three side jobs one to two side jobs a week it's like really going working down. yeah <laughs> five to six may i had maybe one job every other week <laughs> so i wasn't worried about calls coming in after those that month month yeah. of of side jobs so yeah and that's just what happened i ended up you know having and then of course you have the bathroom model which is okay there's two three days of yep. work um so i can't do other service calls or emergencies or whatever and then you have um the the emergencies that come in when you have a full so it was just the balance of those two dichotomies but no i believe it, if i would change anything today obviously with children and everything um i might cushion that to like two months yeah. of side jobs if the customers can wait that yeah. long it's just it some can't and that's i would had to turn those away but you know um just padding that um that workload farther out and then obviously um you know my, i like to say uh you got to be a hero at home first to my wife or to your family <laughs> god bless baby <laughs> So as long as your wife's on board and it makes, and my wife's very practical, very logical, mm -hmm. like, you know, she, if I have an idea, I almost have to have three backup ideas because she will kill oh, yeah. me on, well, what if this happens? What mm -hmm. if that happens? And I'll be, I, I most now being married 12 years, I can, I can um, kind of counter those with what well, I thought of that. Yeah. So this is this, but there's some that she throws me. I'm like, I did not think of that, babe. Like, okay, then I'm not sure what we would do, mm -hmm. but with her being on board and making sense to her, yeah, we that's what we ended up doing. So, and when I had a van at that point too, I don't know if I said that we had a car payment for my wife's car, but I had a fully paid for uh, Chevy Astra. Oh van. yeah, dude, the, the, the Astra. Old... <laughs> dude, what happened to the Astra? For the longest time, that was like the Mennonite brethren staple. You got four kids. You're piling them in the green Astro. Now I don't see any of them suckers on the road anymore. Yeah, they're uh, an antique. They were great, they are, though. But they, yeah, they were they were workhorses, and they kept they was just go and go and go and go and go, dude. And that's something. To, now I'm getting off track a little bit here, but we'll we'll circle back. Um, it's your podcast. The this is something that baffles me. With we're going to go on a hardcore tangent because it's just going to lead into other things. But I want to dive here with young people now. 
A, I don't feel like young people go through the awkward teenage middle school years. I So I, I went to the beach the other day. Not the other day. This was literally like last summer. And like when I was in middle school, I was fat. My hair was gross. My mom still bought my clothes. So they were from like Goodwill. So they looked like my grandfather just dressed me. <laughs> and it just wasn't a good time. I didn't know how to style my hair. I didn't know anything. Um, now, dude, you go to the beach and these kids are like dime pieces, which is weird to say because I'm 25 and it's illegal, but I'm not just saying it's like they don't go through these awkward years anymore. Getting back into the cars, cars are sweet and it pisses me off because it's like, dude, you're never going to experience having that trash car. That was like the rite of passage to get into like. I don't know. They like you see these sweet Kias nowadays, and like it's like this fifteen year. It's like first off, you don't even have a license. I don't even know how you're driving that. <laughs> Second off, get a garbage car. It's like it's wild. I don't know if it's just like the influencer lifestyle has crept into like younger teens, but it's like yeah, you go and these guys have like this fresh lined out cut and it's like what on first off where did you get the money for that i had two <laughs> nickels and literally i couldn't even spend those because i rubbed them together for heat um <laughs> but it was like now they're all decked out it's like you got a gold chain on you're dripped out and all this like designer and it's like this is insane but then you go into the like i don't know yeah i don't know if it's just that influencer lifestyle where it's now we have more accessibility to information so it's like makeup tutorials and stuff like that and like i don't know i don't know if it's a good thing or it's a bad thing it's just like dang these kids are good looking i was ugly so maybe it's an insecurity i don't really know <laughs> anywho that was a wild tangent if you got anything to say on no that. i i think yeah the influencer lifestyle or the influencers that some of these kids are watching is definitely you know, life put together. It's the Instagram versus reality. Oh, you yeah. see those videos all the time, the Instagram versus reality. Um, but I think, too, a lot of time, in my generation, I felt like, and especially the area I grew up, like, we we did hard. Like, for example, I did a newspaper route. Oh, yeah? I biked yeah. every single day. I think it was almost three miles round trip, starting with 40 newspapers in the back of my basket, my bike and bike. And it wasn't like mom made me, dad made me, but it was like, hey, if you want to make money, mm-hmm. there's newspaper out, there's working for at the far- a farmer, for a farmer, uh, whatever. Um, and mom didn't drive me. I never asked mom to drive me. She was willing to do it on the really rainy days, but I was like, no, I- I'm willing to do it. Yeah. Like I can, I can do it. And, and so it, it's... I don't know if it's, you know, my dad was always a go-getter. Like, he'd bike. My dad would bike 12 miles to work yeah, one he way. he told me that. That's insane. Yeah, 24 miles round trip. He was a marathon runner. He qualified for Boston two, three years in a row when That's I was nuts. real young. Did he so, run it? Yeah, he ran the Boston Marathon with Oprah Winfrey. No way. And Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, I think this was 93 or 94. Yeah, she had security guards run with her. Did she? Did so, he beat her? I think he did, yeah. I think, I'm pretty sure. Get wrecked, I, Oprah. I forget. <laughs> I forget what he placed, but yeah, he qualified. Anyway, so I say that to say that that was my example growing up. Um, not only that, but like getting up early, like mm-hmm. my dad was up at like 3.30 in the morning, even yeah, though that's... he didn't have to be in at work till 7. So, Good for him. But he'd get up early, like he'd have devotions, his time with the Lord. I'd come down to him, you know, falling asleep on the couch. You know, hey, dad. Oh, yeah. How's time it going? You Lord, know, I'm, I'm, I'm having time with the Lord right now. But yeah, dad, you've been sleeping probably yeah. for two hours. <laughs> but, you know, that was that was my life growing up. And that was my example. And, you know, it's not like dad said, you have to do this. Mm-hmm. or You know, you have to bike to to do your newspaper route. You have to get up early, spend time with the Lord. I just saw that. You know, they say more is caught than taught. And that's so true for me in growing up. Like, um, so I back, I, I going back to what you were saying, I think a lot of it's the example that these kids have. Yeah. Um, and I can think of several kids that's a generation or two younger than me that, you know, their example of, of fathers are not so good. So they're, you know, their mom's taking them to work or, you know, and I could think of many, many kids, you know, on top of my head that are like that. But, you know, I think also the the father figure is so, so important mm. in this, this upcoming generation and these kids. And um, when you have a strong father figure in your life, you know, and especially one that doesn't care about looks or, or um, you know, what you have, because my dad was never big, a, a big possessions guy, had to have the latest and greatest, you know, he has a... <laughs> 
<laughs> he has a flat bottom boat right now that has a hole in the back and they call it leaky leaky <laughs> boat and my mom is like trying to hit him have him oh, get rid of it and yeah. he's like no jb weld will take care of that honey i need to get this so he's determined to get this thing not to leak and it looks like uh something out of some horror movie but anyway that's just my dad like mm-hmm. he'll he'll make it work and so yeah. that's my example um i i can definitely relate to you the the haircut the bowl cut you know the they oh, put a bowl in yeah, your head and just get, your hair around, get like, straight amish up in this but, business but that was my example so um you know and and i think it boils down to like i said the father figure but then also um possessions is really taking over this next generation and mm. you see it in influencers you see it in their the the kids lives it has to be the newest Jordans, like this whole shoe market and the whole b- the economy, the economy of shoes and buying shoes and Jordans oh, and yeah. all this stuff. Like I-, I see so many videos online where it's like, oh yeah, I'm wearing hundred thousand dollars shoes. Hundred thousand dollars shoes when I was a kid, there was no way yeah. any of my friends what had hundred thousand. Or would we talk about hundred thousand yeah. dollars shoes? Like that's that's half a house. Yeah, so, four families didn't even have a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> combined. Yeah. So I mean I could go on and on, but yeah, I think it, that's that's ultimately what it boils down to. Uh, what's what's desirable in a kid's life? What they're and you know and back to even influence. If their parents are influencing them, these influence quote unquote, unquote are, and those influencers are pushing yeah. the haircuts, the oh, clothes, yeah. the, the and yeah. they have to because they're in front of the camera. For sure. But you know, and I've heard many stories of influencers being one one personality on camera and completely different behind the camera. And and that's exactly not, what this is. <laughs> we're just good. we're just indoctrinating children. <laughs> dripped out in the most <laughs> designer fashion pretty much just trying to be pewdiepie my sam's club shorts oh yeah dude <laughs> my goodwill slides hey uh oh. thrifting is trendy now so oh, yeah. you rock that goodwill yeah um Velcro. boy that was a tangent where were we before it's kind of hot in here i, I want to see if i can turn this fan on without it messing with the mics too much let me so it doesn't we'll get be right back folks <laughs> Dun, 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 dun. Oh yeah, that feels great. Yeah, I don't have the AC in this room. Yet. It's kind of frustrating. <laughs> you know what? The studio hasn't been making as much money as it used to pull in, so we got to make sacrifices. But I don't yeah, think that you got to pay me. So, oh uh, dude, I guess I... <laughs> freaking guest, <laughs> thinking they own the world. I'm an influencer, whatever. <laughs> but uh, man, what were we saying? We were talking about jobs. We were talking about. Security. You were saying about security in that position that all yeah, came so up at the church. In that, the security versus, I guess, freedom. I guess maybe even I'm going through that a little bit. Like me and George had a conversation the other day, um, just kind of about the podcast and everything. And the crazy thing is, I make a, I would not like an insane amount of money, but I make a good wage for my age, I believe. And he's like, so why are you getting into the podcast type deal? Like, where's this gone? Like, are you gonna, like planning on leaving GH or whatever? <laughs> um, we had a really good conversation about it. I was like, no, honestly, but like in today's world, and I think in today's world for the expectation that society puts on living, like I just don't make enough money. And it's like at some point, hopefully someone sponsors this and we make some money from it. <laughs> Down the road. But I do think there is something to that where it's like the expectation of what you need to do in right. like a year is way higher. And I think that has to do kind of with the influencer lifestyle type yeah. deal. Um, but it's like, oh, well, we need to go on two vacations a year to Barcelona and freaking Ireland. It's like, what? No, dude. A vacation when I was growing up was we got a paper bag and we put it on each other's head. We pushed the sibling down the stairs and took it off. It's like, you're in France, you idiot. Like, it was, we didn't go on vacations. Like, we, we hardly went out to eat. Like, we thought going out to eat was going to Burger King, which was insane. And now it's like, oh, you're going out to eat every weekend with friends. If you're getting drinks or whatever, um, you need to be decked out with the Nuna Duna Luna baby stroller. 
<laughs> and you gotta have, and baby stuff is ridiculous. Expensive. It's stupid. Like a, they're gonna outgrow it. B, they're gonna poop on it. C, they're gonna throw up on it. And D, they don't care. They're not. What, what baby's like? I don't have my Luna. Like it's like no, no baby even knows. Right. And it's just like right. I don't know. I think the expectation for the standard of living has just elevated. And with that expectation, and don't get me wrong, all those things are fun. I love doing those things. I do those things, and that's why I'm broke. So it's like, <laughs> I get it. I'm not bashing on those people at all, but it's like, if you still want that lifestyle, there's you need to make extra streams of income. Um, and then tying that back in with what we were saying, with getting your own business, yes, there is much more risk involved in that, but I would say there's much more reward to live the higher elevated, not really status, just life. Yeah. For sure. I heard it put this way a couple months ago, I believe it was, on a a reel or something that I saw. And let's go back 50 years ago, you didn't see very many high rollers, Mm -hmm. what I call high rollers. Yeah. You know, you saw like, 50 years ago even 100 years ago you know you might see the like for us the mansions in Lancaster yeah. or city like that would be like probably it 100 years ago 50 years ago but now you have the internet mm-hmm. you know as 20 that's been around what 20 years I guess now um, you have the internet you have these influence so you see across the, the world, world in Dubai yeah. this guy driving a gold Ferrari or a gold Lamborghini that you would never see 50 yeah. years ago you would so and, and so what they're doing is they take the, the standard, not standard of living, but like the goal of like, wow, that's making it yeah. to a whole nother level ladder. versus 50 years ago, 100 years ago, it was like, you know, oh, it's, it's um, I don't know, uh, the owner of such and such business yeah. has that big mansion. You if know, you had two horses in your stall, you were loaded. <laughs> it like, but it made it more uh that tangible is not the word like achievable like, yeah okay that that person because you know you dealing with the the demographic of where we live um you're dealing with the the farmer lifestyle the just the area it's not across the world where the guy struck oil yeah. and you know because then his neighbor might be you know he has four ferraris he only his neighbor has two and those are, anyway so the it the internet has taken what our concept is of of making it and high roller or whatever the, mm-hmm. the word is to a whole nother level. I'll tell you what to put it in perspective is going to uh, a third world country. Oh, yeah. Um, I was in Haiti in 2020. And, you know, we live a high roller life oh, compared yeah. to some of those those folks. <laughs> Lighting <laughs> fan. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, we didn't have fans down yeah. there. We didn't have like we were sweating in a concrete um, building, but like uh, the kids, the kids don't know anything mm-hmm. else. So they're the, 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 I heard of one story of a boy who was in the orf, the, the orphanage that I was helping out with takes the worst of the worst cases. Um, they only about six to eight, I'm uh, sorry, six to nine children, um, new life mission. It's called, it's a new mission, young couple. The, the, the wife is from Ephrata and then the husband, um, is from Haiti, but they took a boy that was, I believe he was three or four. His mom, dad, his dad, his mom died. His dad died. His aunt passed. I think his grandma was taking care of him. Dang. Um, but his grandma couldn't really keep track of him all the time because she had others children she was taking care of he was three or four on the dirt streets on the dirt roads and um i believe he had he had worms as well all kinds of crazy stuff so they took him in um and adopted him or or, or orphan you know orphan adopted him kind of a thing but yeah you listen to these stories and you hear these stories and it just puts your life in a whole Mm -hmm. whole nother perspective to say you know wow i really am blessed to have what i have you know um and, and I heard some, several stories even this weekend um, of, of just children abused here in Lancaster City. Um, the one boy is seven years old now. He was kept as a child in a dog crate. Oh, dang. And he is permanently disformed because he was in there that long f- from whatever, I'm not sure how young, but his he, he, per, he has a permanent hunch to himself dang. now. His parents are both in prison. Their the custody went to the one um, grandparents. The grandparents actually busted the door down to rescue the kids. Um, Strong grandparents. So gosh, yeah, dang. they busted the door down to rescue the kids. Um, the 
the daughter was zip tied into a car seat. Jeez. And to this day, they find her with cords around her neck because that's comforting to her because she was zip tied into her wheelchair, or I'm sorry, into her car seat, soiled diaper unit. So these kind of stories. I don't mean to take us to a dark place all of a sudden, but these kind of stories help put my life and my children's, me and like just being so thankful for my children, mm-hmm. my wife being a good mother, but put, helps put my life into perspectives to say, wow, I am so blessed. Yeah. Um, you know, we're so blessed. And, you know, I was told this story at a pool party this weekend. And even just a little bit of st- time that I had with this little girl kind of totally changed my my concept of where she was from and yeah. maybe even some of her attic because they said, you know, she's a typical five year old but um there are times where she just gets really angry uh, angry or steal stuff and so instead of just lashing out on her to understand wow she came from a hard place a dark place and we need to show her the love of christ and and be a light to her so anyway if you look hard enough there are stories like that all over and help put your your life my life into perspective and be thankful for what we have but i recommend a mission trip that if anyone has not gone on one to go to a third world mission trip or just even honestly like like Lancaster City, help yeah, out. Some parts of help, Lancaster help City are third world, dude. Help out at yeah. that job today, and who we help out at the the homeless shelter too. Which that was crazy. So we just went down to a job in Lancaster today. Yeah, George was telling me about, and it, it was a restaurant that kind of got shut down. They're revamping it now, but above the restaurant was six rooms, no kitchens. So it's just like rooms, small rooms, uh, way smaller than this. Probably the one, the guy that there said the one was like an eight by eight. And these eight rooms or six rooms shared two bathrooms. Like, and they, they, they were each different tenants, but they literally only had two bathrooms. They didn't have a kitchen. And like the place was, yeah, third world-esque, dude. <laughs> it was insane. And then you're like, okay, yeah, I have a pretty good but even even with the whole influencer thing, I feel like no one's going on except for us. Like we'll say we're broke, but like <laughs> no one is posting the bad times, so you don't think they exist for those people, right? You're like, oh my word! Like these people are in million dollar house, driving a hundred thousand dollar car, and it's like this is just what life is. Like this is what it is, yep. and it's like no, like no one's posting what they had to do to get there or if they came by it honestly or who they had to scratch and claw to get to that point. Right. So you don't think about it. You're just like, oh, this is like, this is life. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. We talk about influencers a lot on this podcast. <laughs> They're influencing you. I know, they are influencing me and I'm influencing you. <laughs> Man, I just can't wait to be the influencer life. Driving my Ford Focus around. Maybe I'll afford a wing for it, pimp that thing out. I uh, heard... There's a, uh, it was at a, um, an accountant, and he said that he was actually, he said he has more, no, let me back up. Accountant, he said he has a client that's worth $8 billion, Dang. But he said you'd never know it. Yeah. He didn't go into great detail, but it sounded like an older gentleman, maybe 50s, 60s, drives a uh, uh, Jeep Cherokee um, on the street. You couldn't pick him out as a billionaire, eight eight billion. But he said um, he has... 85, 85 or 95 percent of his clients that are going through divorce have nothing but live 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 lavishly, lavishly and just but their lives are mm-hmm. just absolutely miserable yeah but and so his point was don't judge a, a book by its cover just because uh an influencer is yeah. putting up these vi- and we all know this of course from scripture and stuff but just because they're putting up these videos or flaunting their yeah. their wealth you know the bible says jesus said about storing the the foolish man who stored um he built bigger barns to store more and yep. then the next day his life was was asked of him or taken from him i'm um, paraphrasing of course but yeah that's that's the influencer life in a nutshell Heck yeah. if if and there are some good ones out there, far and few between, but there are some. But yeah, just storing up for uh, in life here with mater- um, maternity gains, not maternity. Maternity. Uh, maternity. <laughs> yeah, we just got a bunch Monetary. of pregnant women standing around here. Monetary what gains. on earth? Monetary gains or things of this world that, you know, hey, you could be in a car accident tomorrow and your life be, you know, taken from your life is gone. Vapor. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I don't know. That's. And that's something, too, which if you talk to really rich people, like I'm talking like, screw you money, um, <laughs> there's 
and I've talked to, I don't have obviously access to a lot of these people, but those are the people where it's like, they don't need to prove themselves to you. Right. They don't need that million dollar car, or the hundred thousand dollar Rolex. Um, because it's like, no, I have like what, what me proving myself to someone that makes 50 grand a year. Like that's insane to them, which it is. It's like, yeah, why would they need to show anyone so they're, the, I think they're much more secure. But then when you get to the like semi-rich people, it's like they're the ones dripped out and everything, and it's like everything's on payments. And you, yeah. you would think they would be at this super elevated status when in reality, not usually the case. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to go for. Just absolutely dripped out. <laughs> just every my whole life's on payments. Um, no, I'm kidding. I don't actually have. I don't have any payments at Good. this at this point in my life. That's great. But I might. <laughs> um, but uh, payments, influencer lifestyle, business. Is there anything within business? So like starting your business, now growing it to what it was uh, 10 years. Um, maybe a lesson. You, I don't know if it's a lesson. Like obviously – Okay, a prime example. When you take something, even my position at work, because pretty much the only thing I can do is go from my own experiences and engage the world through that. But like for me, until I was placed in a situation of not not necessarily a do or die, but like more responsibility is put on me, I didn't really care. It w- did you find within business, it was all of a sudden like, no, I don't have this security. And then you cared infinitely more and that's kind of what developed your business do you operate like that do you understand what i'm trying to say i would say yeah i think i get what you're trying to get at um yeah for me when i'll put it this way when i started one on my own and it was me myself and i doing the work yeah i would say i started really crossing the t's Mm dotting the i's because the person that's going to get called back to fix whatever it is is me Mm -hmm. i'm not going to make any money doing that if it's a mistake um and so i really started caring more taking my time a little bit more um you know even if if i lost money quote unquote or if i had to ask for more money i'd rather the job be done right and be the reputation of that than oh yeah he's he's a great price but he does you know crappy work yeah. or he doesn't finish his jobs or whatever um and even the bible says that that um uh master not master craftsmen but craftsmen that are good at their work will do work before kings i believe is kind of how it's par- i'm paraphrasing that but that's kind of what and that's in proverbs that's the message yeah. <laughs> that's the message that's version the people <laughs> yeah, not, nice. not the kjv right there <laughs> holy we didn't have a single thou or thou that not. was the, the matthew king james no um but that was kind of my my what i wanted to stand behind was do good work mm-hmm. um and and create a good craft or, or be a good craftsman because that's what's the reputation that's going to go precede me not uh joe schmo does an okay job and yeah you yeah. get a leak or two but at least it's done and yep. done cheaply so yeah I, as i s- progressed and and continued my my business i really started caring more um paying attention to the details and learning a lot i learned so much because i made those mistakes and it was like oh okay i can't run this this pump without a vent like it mm-hmm. has to have a vent to, and i never really did that before uh i remember the first time i pulled a well pump i youtubed it like oh, the morning yeah, of or the dude. night before <laughs> like i i pulled a well pump once uh, i don't really remember this was like several years ago before when i actually did it and i'm like i don't remember i youtube it and i'm like yeah i got this yep so uh thankfully i think that pump's still working today but yeah that's just how i did it and um learned on the job asked questions called people that maybe knew better than me or had them come help me on a job and yeah. paid them for it and even if if they made more money than i did but hey next time i know you know what how i'm doing. doing um so yeah you you and when it when it the buck stops with you and everything is on your shoulders for a business to to make it or not, you really not that you do drastic things, but you might do things a little bit more out of your comfort oh, yeah, zone. For sure. of, like I say, making that phone call and say, "Hey, mm-hmm. Frank, I don't know what I've I've done this. I've only done this once before, but like, can you help me through this, mm-hmm. or can you um, come out to the job, or can you when I'm done with it come look over everything? Yeah, so you kind of put you out of your comfort zone a little bit. You might do things you don't normally do, but it's all part mm-hmm. of growing. And I think that's like even so transitioning from me in the field to me in to the office now kind of developing a position on my own realizing how i'm wired is if i have 
I almost need to do like a famine type situation for me to do a good job. Like, hey, this is a do or die. Like if it's because when I was in the field, Christian was always my superior. Yeah. And he had a obviously a uh, a way more experienced plumber than me. But when I am around people that have more experience, I can very much plead ignorance so they just do it. Because it's like, ah, this probably won't be up to your standard. I'm not even going to try. But then literally I'll come home and I'll do a full bathroom remodel by myself where on the job I wouldn't even set like shower. It's like I know how to do all this stuff. Yeah. But it's like for me personally, I just needed like it would have been better for me to just be like thrown to the job and be like, hey, figure this out. And I, I could have done it a hundred percent. But since I always had that buck to pass type right. deal, right. I don't know I don't know why, probably because I watched too much movies and played too many video games that there's <laughs> there's something loose upstairs um that I'm like that. But then transitioning to the office, it's like, dude, you can't pass the buck to anyone. Yeah. Like if this doesn't go through, you're to blame. Right. Then it's like, oh, yeah, shoot. And you do an infinitely better job, at least for my personality, and you care way more. Like, in the field, it's like, ah, if I know they'll pick it up, I don't really need to do it. They're better than I, – I would always use – like, oh, they're better. So, like, they can do it. Right. Um, but then when it's like, hey, it's my own position, and then you have the freedom to develop it to what you want it to be. You're like, oh, like – because then you do care. It's like, hey, I can develop this. And then if I do, then it can it can benefit da 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 da. Yeah. So then you care even more, which is weird because it's like you do have more responsibility, but in turn that breeds like more freedom. I don't know. It's kind of a weird thing. It's even like I don't know if this super relates. I don't know why my brain just went here, but even like with Christianity, so it's like you're a slave to Christ, which inherently means like you are bound, but in that the freedom. It seems counterintuitive because you're like, well, how can you be slaved and then then be the most free you've ever been in your life? Um, And I don't really think you understand those type of things. Like so many people told me that, like things along those lines. And I think for certain people, maybe they can just pick it up. And God bless those people because they will go through way less hardship. But I think for some people, you just need to go through it yourself. Yeah. And it's like until you do it clicks like it's like, oh, like some people it's like you just need to make those mistakes to actually figure out this makes sense. Like, this is a legitimate thing. So that was kind of interesting for me. I don't know how I got there. Um, and you're a people person. So, like, yeah. when you would go out and do estimates, like, I know George just told me this, like, it was so natural for you to be, like, talking to people. You grasp the uh, enough of plumbing and to know, like, okay, this is the info we need, measurements we need, mm-hmm. whatever pictures we need, that kind of thing. So, you know, you took your experience from the field and then your your people skills and combined them yeah. to the position you have now. And I know George just said that, you know, you've blossomed really, really well. Just like doing a cherry that. tree. It's just, just, like a, just, just beautiful. Like a oh. lion. Uh, Whoa, dude, that's whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Screw you, dude. <laughs> this new boss <laughs> business <laughs> sucks. <laughs> You took it this this position, made yeah. it your own, and no one told you how to do it exactly mm-hmm. how to do it. You know, maybe George gave some some insights and some, some for guidelines. sure. Yeah, you still need but, guidance, but yeah, you and it's something that you enjoy and 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 I feel like as men and and as husbands, like when we are when our feet are put to the fire, like it's either do or die. Yeah. You go figure it out, yep. or it's gonna crumble and fall. Like when when men are put in that position, you know, I think of like. Um, um, the, the battle of the bulge or taking um, uh, D-Day, like taking mm-hmm. the beach. Like these young men, 19, uh, 18, whatever, when they were told like, yeah, we got to take this beach. Um, they weren't told, I, I've heard stories of like, they didn't know how bad it was going to be. Yeah. Um, they thought when those gates fell on those aquatic vehicles that like they were going to face the enemy. But then when there was no enemy, they were like, okay, well, I guess we're just running yep. and seeing all the people. But it was, their feet were put to the fire and it was take this beach or die mm-hmm. or die trying. And I kind of, not that, that, you know, 
every guy goes through that or every man goes through that. But when you are – that weight is put on your shoulders. Of, and that's back to me with my business. Like, yeah, like if I don't – this business doesn't thrive or grow or develop, I'm back to where I was. Yep. You know, I don't want to be called a failure, but I would feel like a failure. Yeah, my boss said my, that position was available to me, but no man wants to start out in something, try to do something, and then not work and have yeah. to take four steps back yep. and eat the humble pie or whatever. Um, so for me, it was a do or die. It was try to make this work, do everything mm-hmm. prep um, in preparation as possible, as much preparation as possible, but then try. So I feel like, or it seems like with what you're telling yeah. me, that that was just something that, that you had to develop. No one above you to tell you how to do it. And it was kind of a, a feet to the fire mm-hmm. and, and make it work kind of a thing. And I think even something along those lines, I was talking to a gentleman the other day where we would have grew up same theological beliefs but we disagree on a good amount of stuff and i would have never thought i would have heard this from him but he was telling he came from a broken home um and he was telling me a story about his dad and divorced his wife and everything he said he's like you know my dad just stopped fighting and for whatever reason i don't know why but that just stuck with me and i feel Mm -hmm. like in life especially for me and i don't know about for young kids i still I should do like a, I don't know, psychology class or, or a class on the brain with what media and technology does to it. Because I feel like I suffer from that, dude. <laughs> but like, he's like, he just like, he stopped fighting. And I just look at every aspect in my life. It's like, oh, dude, I can so easily just stop fighting. Yeah. Like, it's just like, nah, I'm going to watch TV today. Right. Like, I'm just going to do whatever. And I think something that is maybe becoming more of a thing, like... They they make the, the, the shorts and the memes about it. It's like my dad when he was 18, like storming the beaches, me when I'm at 32 playing video games. Right. There is a bit of truth to that, though. And it's like, we're just not fighting. Like, yeah. And I don't mean like, oh, like barbaric men, like trampsing through the woods. It's like, no, like in basic things. Like you need to fight within, at least for my own experience. Like I need to fight to get up in the morning. Like I need to fight to, yeah, get out estimates. Like everything it's just like and i think so many times we can just like clock out and be in that comfort zone and that's where that security comes back in like oh like i really like there's so many times i've like really wanted to do legitimate things in life and then i'm like i'll scroll on my phone where it's like i'm replacing what i legitimately want to do with something more basic just because it's easier and more numbing um so even like with yeah, even with the podcast, I struggle with this. Like, hardcore. Like, it's like, I really want to do this. I want to have people on. I want... And then editing <laughs> editing comes around, and I'm like, dude, what am I... Let's go play Xbox. Like, editing sucks. Whoever's, like, good at editing, God bless you, dude, because <laughs> it's so... Like, and it's just, like, in every little thing, like, you just need to keep fighting. And I think for guys, I can't speak for women on this, but, like, you kind of need to put your back to the wall. So it's like, okay, like, I need to fight. Or like we said, like, I will die or, or whatever is the worst thing that'll happen. Like, that will happen. Like, you almost need that to just propel yourself forward. And then eventually it gets easier. I feel like I'm just in the point of life where it's just like, you're just fighting. <laughs> if yeah. you're not fighting, then you just sit on the bench. Um, and then you wake up the next day and you're like, well, I'm a piece of garbage. Why didn't I actually do what I wanted to do? Like, I just watched four hours of cats, like, smittening something and it's just like what am I doing um, but that I don't know it, it, and that's like I don't really think there's obviously there's pros and cons but I think they're just consequences like it's like in everything you do there's a consequence like if you if you go on your phone for four hours you have the good consequence of hey you feel good in that time and then the bad consequence comes where it's like eh, you probably feel like crap later you didn't do what you wanted to do and then you deal with that and it's like in, in every choice in life it's just like okay like Everything has that consequence. Like, no matter what it is, good or bad, there's always a consequence to what you're deciding. So, something that'll take that to a whole nother level once you get there is children. Oh, yeah. Children dude, come I'm along. Terrified. Um, you know, as I have a, I have a son and a daughter, seven and three, and, you know, leave, uh, even just being disciplined, you know, get, uh, getting home from work, eating supper. Okay, now it's it's time for for baths and showers, whatever, putting dishes away after supper. Like all of that is just routine and, and going through the going through this daily routine and, and all that's that's needed. But even getting up in the morning mm-hmm. as a father and as as a provider, you know, I, I, that's a God given or God instilled 
instinct, I believe, in all men. Mm -hmm. And so for me, um, yeah, I mean, the influential life of staying in bed all day, that might appeal to to some some guys and some some people for a short short period of time and a certain period of time. I knew I know a a somewhat influential guy and he said um, he actually did that. I'm (laughs) right here. He he um uh he made it quote unquote as an influencer. He was bringing over seven hundred k a year. Dang. Um and and doing he did uh, Instagram videos, Facebook videos, and then for a month and a half he he lived in Florida. He bought a almost a million dollar house with him and another two other guys, and he rode jet ski for every every day for a month and a half. And then he said he hit a brick wall. It was yeah. like this is boring. Um, mm-hmm. I'm tired. He was tired of the quote unquote influencer yeah. life because he had he had a um, tree business after that or before that. And so anyway, it, he he does more in his life now and is is more involved in more entrepreneurial stuff mm-hmm. and business stuff, not tree work, but uh, other stuff. Um, but the, my point is the the children bring a whole nother dynamic to that, and the fact of providing for them and being there for them, mm-hmm. and um, again that that uh, feat the fire kind of a thing um it just puts and then also raising them in this this economy not a, not an economy economy yes but this this woke world and woke mindset and just how oppressive it is i mean my wife and i have found even in in quote unquote conservative circles um we've we've had some some situations come up and things happen and it's just some libby any dog. any any area that the devil can get in and influence your children or take away the innocence of them, he will. Mm-hmm. And we're, my wife and I have found that more and more, um, no matter how hard we try. And ultimately, we can't protect them from everything in, in the world or everything that comes mm-hmm. their way, but try to prepare them for it. But um, as far as, as getting up and doing doing um, sometimes the hard things or, or putting your feet to the fire, um, yeah, children will do that more than, oh, yeah. more than anything else. And that's kind of my heart right now. Like my biggest uh, desire in life right now is just raising my children in the fear and knowledge of the Lord and staying true to that path mm-hmm. and not wavering, you know, when they're teenagers and, and that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, it's so important. The Bible says to train a child in the way you should go and you shall not depart from it. Um, and if you get into like, uh, um, the Hebrew, or I'm sorry, the Jewish traditions, um, they have what's called a bar mitzvah oh, and yeah, that's at yeah. 13 and 13 they're considered a man so if you're raising a child from zero to 13 seems like a lot 13 years along but my son's over halfway there already at seven um and they say some of the best and most influential years of character development is between three and nine i believe it is three and nine or three and seven so if if he's going to nine he's got i got two years left to build that character and and get it in there dude and yeah and and it's so true because even like I can I can think of situations and and um, people in my life at that age from like three to five like I can remember some life altering or 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 um, you know really um, memorable moments even at that age that that you know I might I might have have anything quite as memorable at as later on in life Mm -hmm. um and had some drastic things happen when i was young and i still remember to this day um and and to me it seems like i'm just like a movie like it just can play over and over again oh yeah Um, but yeah it's just a very impressionable year time um and anyway i'm going on a tangent but yeah i shot some birds with a bb gun when i was probably seven and that still messes me up i think (laughs) little babies in a in a nest dude Horrible, horrible time. Yeah. Bad decisions. The devil got a foothold on my life on that one. Kill. Kill. I don't know. No, I'm just messing. Um, What were we saying before we got on that tangent? What were we talking about? I feel like I had something else to say. Money, influencer, uh, work. Moving to the office about? kind of put your feet to the fire. Oh, yeah. Um. Watch this for watch reel, reels for four hours. Or yeah, do man, something. I love reels. And the other thing is, they're so darn good, and they're addictive. People are so clever. I oh, this is tangent. I'm gonna go there though. Um, so wow, this is like this is a triple tangent, but we'll get back to it. Um, a, you talked about your dad running a marathon. Uh huh. Moving into that, I think I am like. If I'm not doing something extreme, I'm being uh, like lethargic. 
So a lot of things in my life, it's just like, you know what? No, like I'm just going to do this one day. No thought, no preparation, no nothing. Like the one day, um, got the thought in my mind. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go down to Philly and I'm going to be homeless for a week. How old were you in then? Uh, 18. So went down, did it. Everyone, mom, well, not everyone. Mom was losing her mind. Um, <laughs> but I had to call her every night. It was good. And I still think I Just carry. Just by yourself with anyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but I think I like carry that throughout my life where it's like, okay, like I'll just like get to a certain point and it's like, okay, like that's enough. Like we just need to do it. My newest thing, which I don't know where I got this stick up my butt at, but it's like, okay, like I'm just going to run a marathon, like not a legitimate marathon. Like I'm going to go on the rail trail. It's 14 miles. I'll run it twice at night with no training. And I don't know why, but it's just like, I have to do this and I have to do this within the next two weeks. Um, so we'll see how that goes, but yeah, I feel like there are certain things where it's just like, you kind of need to, yeah, put that. Cause if I'm not doing stuff like that, and that's just me personally, I'm not saying everyone else is like that, but just for me personally, like doing extreme stuff like that, like everyone's like, that's retarded. Like, why are you doing it? Yes, it is to, to a, to a normal person, it's insane. But if I don't do this, I'm just going to stay in this rut of like whateverness, just yeah. kind of lethargicness. Oh, then my other one was I want to do a 12 day fast. Um, not for spiritual reasons, just because it's like I need it. I don't know. I feel like I just need to prove stuff to myself. Sure. I don't know. Sure. It's weird. I think for men, too, we have those those victories or those those standards we set and we get those small victories so um you know whether it's waking up in the morning and i don't want i don't want to hit the snooze mm-hmm. button this morning okay that's a victory and sometimes you know we overlook those oh, little man, i victories. lose that battlefield <laughs> every morning <laughs> but for the for the times where we set that goal and that um standard let's say of you know i'm going to run a marathon mm-hmm. or i'm going to do a fast like Sometimes us as men have to do those hard things to prove, if nothing else, to ourselves that we can do it Mm -hmm. and we can push ourselves to do it. And for me, like um, one small victory that I have almost every day is an 18-hour fast. So like whenever I – my last meal or whatever, I count 18 hours. So if I can hold myself from eating, that's a victory for me to to that certain point. And, yeah, it feels like my body's eating itself, which it essentially is. But, um, you know, that that might be one victory for me. Uh, For for some guys, it might be not hitting the snooze button. It might be not – cursing someone out on the highway or something like that but for for us as men i feel like we have to we when we set those goals and we meet those goals those are victories that that we shouldn't overlook because that's us um accomplishing stuff in our day and yes those all are petty and whatever for sure those the 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 bible also says that um a man without vision a man without vision um I can't remember the rest of it, but basically, a man without vision true. is no- mm. <laughs> is nothing. Preach, and I find- brother! <laughs> it's so true. Like I, I say this to young men that are are dating or um, engaged, that if you don't have a vision as a young guy, and you know, tell your spouse or your future spouse where you're going, how are they supposed to be able to join you? Oh, if yeah. it's just willy nilly doing whatever, you know, uh, uh, women love security that they love, um, um, you know, running to, to a shelter or whatever. And you as a guy, if you don't have that established there, some women might find it attractive, but most will not. Most yeah. need a man with vision um, to know which way they're running. I like to say, like, if you're running a marathon or you're running a race, you want to be able to look beside you for a, a spouse and see someone running the same mm-hmm. direction, the same pace or whatever the case may be. Um, so yeah, that's so important for us guys to have vision and also to accomplish those, those goals, do hard things. And to each, each man, it's different in each guy. It's, it's oh, a yeah, little dude. bit, a little bit, um, Oh, I unique. can talk to not having a vision. I'm one where I don't have a vision for anything. <laughs> like I'm, I'm well, getting, you do. I'm you getting have better a vision. at it. I'm podcast. getting better at it, for sure. Have been pod- this is, this is, um, you know, this is a legit hard, um, T- touchable tangible vision that you've set and it's yeah, accompli- you accomplished for it. sure but like I, I like even with dating okay so I was I was an awesome pre-dater let's say that awesome. man I was fun I was flirtatious I was freaking everything bad boy smooth <laughs> I didn't plan out anything so it was just like yo let's like go do whatever and it's like oh my word it's so cool and then you get married and that 
crap gets old to them quick because it's like, dude, what are you doing? So like literally for the first year of our marriage, like it was generally people are like, oh, the first year is super hard for us. It was a breeze because I didn't cast any vision like we didn't go anywhere. We literally were just in the mud and then it was it was fine until year two and three rolled around and then we reaped the consequence of me not casting a vision as a leader and it's like oh i realized hey i don't know how to lead her because i don't know how to freaking lead myself so you got to learn how to lead yourself first before you can lead someone else right um but yeah no and then obviously getting better at it getting more mature even within yeah what you more mature as a husband more mature as a person more mature as a man more mature as a spiritual leader um then you get vision and then it's a growing thing. And even with this, it's like, yeah, I didn't really have a vision once I started, but then it's like, Oh, now like let's shape and shift and tweak and, sure. and everything with, with, within that realm. So yeah, another tangent, but a good one. And that's how it was with life flow. When I started life flow plumbing, I wanted to do all things plumbing. And then within the first three, four years, five years, I'm like, no, I really enjoy service. Yeah. So I started so you tweak it. Yeah. Tweaking it, whittling it down, mm-hmm. not doing as many um, new construction jobs and more service. And yeah, that's that's part of life. You, you go through and you tweak things and you you shape it to your vision. You know, God made us all unique in our own simple, yeah. sim- not simple ways, but our own unique ways. And if we were all the same, it'd be like robots. It'd be yeah. like Boris right. Smith, I robot. Like oh, we'd all be standing there. Well, maybe not boring. That was a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> just, just saying good movie but yeah it would be boring like mm-hmm. it would be totally boring so you know it, it has to be different it has to be unique God created us all all in our own special way and yeah if, if it was anything else mm-hmm. it would be boring in now getting back to I guess your journey through the plumbing industry in that were there any times where it's like dude I'm hanging it up like I'm done or like any mm. big financial setbacks where it's like, dude, I don't know how we can. Or maybe you were just the Instagram influencer lifestyle where no. you're like, dude, this business is sailing. Nope. No, there were definitely times. Um, I can remember, uh, it might have been year eight, six, six, seven, eight, something like that. I was the only one in the office. Um, early mornings, 4, 4.30 a.m. mornings. I can remember one time there was a span there for like a month or two. It was every <clears throat> every single morning, weekends, like Monday through Friday, early mornings, getting the guys going. We had shop at 6, 6 or 6.30, getting the guys going. And then it was um, in the office Saturday, most of all day Saturday, good chunk <laughs> of Saturday, some Sunday. And I mean, getting up early before church, doing office work, getting back from church, having some family time, whatever, in the afternoon after dinner, getting back in the office. And there was a couple, about a month, a month and a half there that I was just like, I'm ready to hang it up. Like this is this is. Yeah. I enjoy plumbing, but when you're doing it every waking hour, it yep. felt like it got old, and it was yeah. I was ready to, to hang it up there pretty quickly, um, or if it continued that way. And I don't I don't remember what kind of got. I think I just put my nose to the grind and got some estimates done yep. or whatever. But it was literally a month and month month and a half of that. Um, and yeah, it was just pushing through, getting it done and uh making it happen but um yeah there was definitely some time not really too many financial like crazy there was a couple of times where like we weren't going to meet payroll and i i had to we obviously had to dip into our savings account but uh that was only really one or two times yeah. i can remember and it was literally we were owed tens of thousands of dollars and people just didn't Awful pay up and it just pay. they both didn't meet at the same time so yeah and once we got through those couple of times people paid and we were good um but yeah, but backtracking to that really tough time, like uh, yeah, there there were there was a couple years where um, it was really dark for me, and um, I I struggled with with honestly like pornography was a big thing, and it was like my my release or my go to because um, it was just something that I felt like I I had no other outlet, like oh, it yeah. was just something I I I fell into probably before we were married um and i didn't really know much about it before before marriage and then curiosity i always like to say curiosity killed the cat killed the darn i started cat. started on it and um yeah it just snowballed and then it peaked probably 
five years into into business and um i mean it was it was to the point where like i was talking with girls online and stuff like it was it was bad um and as god and and G- yeah god jesus saved me from that brought me out of that opened up to my wife she found some stuff on my phone um year you know five six years into it and i told her i was like yeah i'm struggling with it but i kind of like brushed oh, yeah. it off at that you know but um I, it just really got to a point where um and i know guys like they put filters on mm-hmm. or they get rid of their devices and stuff but my heart was no i want i want this to be taken out of my heart out of yeah. my life i don't want to have a device and be tempted yep so um I, I like to share that, you know, even as a Christian, good old Lancaster County Christian boy, you know, I struggled with that and it was a, a deep, dark sin, demonic for, for sure. And, and Jesus saved me out of it. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm so thankful he did because it's, it's just a, a snare that they can get trapped in. And I think more men struggle with it than, than, than the peop- the church realizes. Oh dude, 90, but- 98% of men struggle with pornography and the other 2% are freaking lying. <laughs> But I'm here to tell you that you can be in the absolute depths of it and God can still save you Mm -hmm. out of it. And I I didn't really open up to like many guys about it and like, man, I'm struggling with this. Help me with it. I wish I would have kind of at the peak more than I did. Um, But now that I'm kind of out of it and and god's god's brought me out of it and and, and i'm um and i i say i'm free of it but i'm never i'm not completely free of lust or temptation too because yeah, that's being that. a guy yeah and i always got to keep myself in check and i'm very very open with my wife but once so once i got past that and opened up to my wife about it our relationship got that much yep. tighter that and i know this is probably cliche for a lot of a lot of guys but i can tell you firsthand it just got so much more um um, intimate so much more um open uh you know she could tell like hey are you okay today like things seem i'll just be honest like no babe like i've been tempted multiple times mm-hmm. or i've fallen today like you know help me or whatever like and i'll i'll text her like back when i was was coming out of it and still like kind of struggling i would text her and be like hey um i'm i'm, I'm getting tempted today um just let you know whatever yeah. but it, it, and it was a struggle that was i mean once i shared with her it probably was almost Almost a year, I would say, till I was completely tempt not completely temptation free, but the desire You're wasn't the there. I was yep. yeah, wasn't there anymore. Um, to the point where I mean, you know, on the regular it was it was a nightly thing or at least a weekend thing. Um, but then when I came out of it it was, you know, maybe once in two or three months mm-hmm. thing. And then, you know, now it's it's even more less than that. It's yeah, very, very rare. But um yeah, it was it was something that God had to work through me uh in my heart and out of my heart um to to really open up to my wife and and have that that flow of communication Mm -hmm. and uh, but i share all that to say that that was probably the darkest place of my personal life and where i was with my business because i just i like i said i didn't really have felt like i had another outlet i would be so frustrated with the day and with myself and and it was just one failure after yep. another with work and it's like well i failed on all that why not just look at this or do this or fail this and mm-hmm. you know and i in my back of my mind would be like well god will forgive me you know i i'm going to repent after it but you know obviously that's not right or yeah. not good but um yeah i'm sure a lot of men have that similar mindset oh, dude. <laughs> even yeah. though it's not not biblical but um yeah i'm just so thankful that that i was brought out of that and saved from that and um don't struggle with that anymore and that's something not that i wasn't expecting the episode to go here but uh, <laughs> we're freaking there so why not go there you can, you can edit it no out no one and this is i guess what kind of frustrates me obviously 99% of men struggle with pornography the other 1% is lying to you so in saying that same boat as you type deal but just thinking over like I, I think I'm one where I very much I seem very goofy and everything on the outside and all that but I internalize a lot of stuff and just process Yeah. and one thing that I guess not bothers me but like okay 99% of us struggle with it why the frick don't we talk about it Yeah. and I think not normalizing the conversation of like making it a joke right but making the topic a little bit more approachable yeah because what pissed me off quite frankly growing up was like all these guys 
where they were just super unrelatable. Like, yeah. oh, this was a terrible thing, terrible. It was horrible. It ruined. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, in my current state where I was when they were giving those, I was like, I love this. Like, I, and obviously that sounds horrible being a Christian, but like, just being honest, like, yeah. no, this is freaking awesome. Right. And then, like, people were like, oh, well, like, it'll ruin your marriage type deal. Like, and I was just like, I don't understand how, when you have the real thing, how you could go to pornography. Yeah. Like if you're in a, if you're in a marriage relationship, you can have all the sex you want. Like, let's go. That is a, that's a horny 18 year old's dream. And it's just like, <laughs> oh, so, so how, how would you even think about that? And no one explains it to you. Yeah. And it's like, they're just like, well, it's bad. And which it totally is. But like, as an 18-year-old kid that's revved up on testosterone, like, break it down for me. Because I, to me, I can't comprehend that. So it's like, okay, so why would you crave pornography over your wife? And it's like, well, it's way easier. Right. Way easier. Yeah. The, the internet will never say no to you. It can give you the most disgusting parts of your mind yeah. that you're afraid to talk to everyone about. And you can do it like that, and it's so easy. Yep. And it's like, A, also, too, sex is work. Like, there's a communication. There's figuring it out. And it's just like, you don't need to do any of that. All it is is instant pleasure, and it's to whatever you want it to be. Yeah, and the the, the uh, chemical release is the same. The yeah, the, the 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 hormone in your brain mm-hmm. or the chemical release in your brain for us men, that's I mean we're we're uh, stimulated by sight. Mm-hmm. Most men are anyway. Um, that's probably the two percent that aren't is the yeah. ones that <laughs> darn freaking liars. <laughs> so for us, it's the sight. So that's all we need mm-hmm. for that chemical yeah, release sure. to happen. Um, and for women, it's normally touch and and words of affirmation mm-hmm. or words of, of endearment or whatever. But, you know, for us guys, and that's where I think a lot of women and my wife included just didn't understand. And now I think she does. But in the beginning when I was mm-hmm. like, trying to explain it to her, and I mean, you know, imagine like the deepest, darkest pit and then trying to tell your wife like, by the way, I'm down here yeah. and this is what's going on. And her just like what like i didn't know it was this bad or yeah. whatever but um and it's a it's a the, the catching crowns has a song called slow fade and it's so true mm-hmm. like it can be a picture here a video mm-hmm. there or um you know our the the, the um uh, society we're in you know girls in, in bikinis like it just at the start of a thought and then it just One leads down leads to another yep down mm-hmm. this road and for us guys it's that chemical releases is, is a video or picture or whatever and you know for some guys maybe a little bit sit and it's done but for others that like hey my and the, part of it for me was uh, my wife worked every other weekend mm-hmm. so i had the whole weekend and this was right when i was starting my business it's kind of how it all started um i was starting my business i didn't really work saturday days um definitely not sundays but so i'd have that i'd be at home alone and like you know honestly just curious and just that's how it all started Mm -hmm. um and for me like like i said it's just that the the sight and and the sounds and the video and then you just start on that trail Mm -hmm. um and it's such a like you said it's such a behind the scenes quick thing you could look on your phone Mm -hmm. and they make they literally make phones with with fake um uh, screens on them that you can flip right to left, so you can be oh, literally yeah. watching it, uh, and, then and, uh, and then you flip the screen and it looks like Facebook or whatever. And then, yeah, I've heard all kinds of stories, um, but uh, it, it's it can be such a slippery slope. And you know, and the devil knows our weaknesses. They say AI, you know, AI will plug in things and send you things. Like if you you know stop and look at a video for ten seconds, it mm-hmm. knows that, so it sends. So that with AI and the devil, I mean, they're probably yeah. two in Darn. one. But AI it's, is the antichrist. It's so easy <laughs> for us guys to go down that road and for it to be quiet, uh, mm-hmm. for us to be quiet about it because we're there. There's okay, the easy access number one, the shame number two. Mm-hmm. One, we don't even want to tell our wives about it or or mom or dad or wherever stage of life we're in. We don't want to tell other guys about it because of the stigma behind mm-hmm. it. But not knowing, like you said, ninety eight percent of them are probably struggling yep. with the same thing. If we would all just be open and honest about it, and you know, there's other there's apps covered in eyes and and different things and and that's all great um but i think just um a man to man or uh you know guys we interact with on the regular Mm -hmm. just saying hey you know whatever i was struggling last night or i fell last night please pray for me um or whatever if if you're in the middle of it you got to make a phone call like or text Uh, i know there's an app that if you search certain sites 
it'll send a text, a text yeah. to a buddy yep. that you link. And so I forget the, what that I forget what program that is. But yeah, yeah, it's out there. So you me can, and my buddy had that. Yeah, for a while. you can call the buddy and say, "Hey, I know mm-hmm. you're looking at this or about to. Like, don't do it. Whatever." So, but I think, like you say, the opening the conversation and having the conversation is much more important, mm-hmm. and to release the stigma and and get away from it. Um, and, and obviously fight that battle because you know we all have battles we fight in our minds. For sure, men, women, it doesn't matter. But um, part of it's just being open and honest about it and um, talking about it. Mm-hmm. And that's something too, like just realizing, like for the younger kid, like that couldn't fathom why how a married man would would stoop to that. But it's like porn never argues with you. Yeah, you never disagree with it. Yep. Like it's it's everything so skewed but that you, you want right like it, it's so twisted and, and deprived but it's like you you twist it in your mind like oh well this is exciting this is fun like this is everything my wife she's just on my case or whatever like we all can get there right we all can do those things where it's just like you just it becomes this it, it literally becomes this god nothing else can come to this realm of like it's my sanctuary. It's yep. like where I go to just relax. Like if I have a crap day, right. like I'm not going to my wife because like this person online can like they do whatever I want or whatever. And yep. it's just like just telling kids I feel like that aspect of it, it's like just educates them a little bit more because it, for me personally, I can't speak for anyone else's experience. It was just like other men that have already went through it and on the other side – it was all the negatives. They were just like, this is bad, bad, bad. And they wouldn't ever to like, they were never, I don't know. Maybe they were still struggling with, it. I have no idea, but they were never honest and like, no, like I loved it. Like, because there it was like, Oh, well like they're better than me. Like they think it's this horrible thing. I'm, I'm right in the middle of it. And I'm like, I love this. Is it, is it, it isn't affecting anyone else. Like I got it. I got it under control yeah. and like, it, it's good. And then once you get to that other side, you start realizing where those men were coming from but it's like i think we can word it a little bit better and educate a little bit better and i think it is it's a very if you're not talking to a uh an honest crowd it's a very uncomfortable thing to talk about yeah if you're not talking to an honest crowd but if you're just talking honestly and like hey this is where i'm at like probably every other man in that room is right there with you so it's not actually that big of a deal yeah um in the fact of shamefulness obviously it's a sin and, and we can go into that plethora of things later but like just being that open honest and like hey like this is where it is i get how you can in in your immaturity view this as an amazing thing yeah like because for me it was just like oh it was horrible and i was just like dude i don't, I don't know what you're talking about this is wild like um and just like yeah that and it, it sounds and i think the thing that I think why men don't talk like that, and this is obviously just my speculation, because it makes you sound like a terrible Christian. Yeah. Which it 100% does, but it's like, you're looking at the garbage, so quite frankly, you are a terrible Christian, because we're all terrible Christians. We all sin every single day. That's what makes us horrible. Not that you're looking at this one thing, but it's like, you gossiped over here, you told a lie over here. In God's eyes, that's all trash. Like, obviously, we're redeemed and all that, and like, that has to be a part of it, but it's like, no, like, we are, like, this is a, a horrible thing, but, uh, and obviously there is shame that goes along with it for sure, but the devil twists that and he uses it to keep you in it. And it's yeah. just like, you know, like, Hey, just be honest and don't obviously don't glorify it. Right. Don't be like, Oh, this was, a, you should do that. Just be honest with the kids. And like, if you are a little bit more and like, obviously with me, I'm a more animated person. If I come off super stern, then the kid, like it, whoever I'm talking to would be like, well, that's not me. Like, hey, I'm going to be myself because that's me. Like, yeah. I, I am I am this. I'm not proud of this. But honestly, just giving it to you straight and, like, not sugarcoating it. Not, and I think something, too, where I could, even, even talking about my testimony in the past, I did use porn as almost an elevated status, like, of being the guy that, like, opened up about it. Yeah. Obviously, a horrible mindset and, and, and super wrong, but, like... Then, then you would almost get the like, oh, wow, like you're so, you're willing to talk about it. <laughs> and obviously that's immaturity and we could go all in that. And <laughs> the things you learn as you grow up. But yeah. yeah. Wild I, tangent, but I heard, glad uh, we went there. I heard a pastor say, um, 
are you he asked a, a gentleman I believe the situation was it was a marriage counseling setup and he had seen many porn addicts come mm-hmm. you know just the symptoms of uh, uh, of the wife acting like i think she i think he's doing this or whatever and he finally just thought about it and he's like you know what i'm gonna ask a question he's never asked before and he had the husband and wife sitting there and he said to the husband he's like are you having an affair and the husband no mm-hmm. and he goes with physical uh, a physical girl or a virtual and the husband was like stopped you could see mm-hmm. he was thinking and he's like Yes, I am having an affair with a virtual, mm-hmm. you know, not obviously maybe one girl, but multiple girls. But that was a good way to, I yeah. never heard it put that way before that, no, this is an affair with a virtual girl, girls, mm-hmm. whatever. Like that's, a, boil it down. That's what it is. Because like in Bible times, <clears throat> like um, Athena, the Roman god Athena, I believe yeah. her name is, and it was the god of, of prosperity, of, of, um, uh, procreation if i'm saying that right um and you had an affair Mm -hmm. you had sex with uh um the the priestess which were women and so yeah it was open and and that was Mm -hmm. an affair and that was you know was super open and for everyone to see or whatever i heard a pastor say it same pastor actually goes that uh yeah when they brought this temple to athena all of a sudden all the men became very religious and yeah. like, come to this temple every week yeah. or whatever <laughs> like like uh, the wives are getting together like yeah our husbands are all religious all of a sudden at the same time anyway um but when he put it that way and this was after i had already kind of uh, come out of it and 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 crossed the hump i guess you could say but i was like that's a good way to put it for guys if they open up to me about it or just say I'm struggling with it mm-hmm. especially if they're married you can say it that way and not to degrade them but just because in my mind like I would repent I would look at it I would repent and I would move on for a week mm-hmm. or a t- two days three days and then I would just be frustrated with something mostly business related mostly work related work drama whatever and um, you know just home life wasn't great so you know at night I'm looking at it again and then I'd repent again and it was just that cycle yeah. but I think if someone would have kind of helped break it down for me a little bit more because in my mind like I said um, I repented so whatever I'm, I'm moving on with my day but then to really say because my other thing was like well it doesn't well, oh let me back up and say my um logic was well and i still would like an answer in in heaven when we get to heaven but like why were they why didn't the old testament were they allowed to have concubines Mm -hmm. like why and i believe god (laughs) it wasn't a good Mm -hmm. idea so the new testament when when christ he talks about one man and one woman um and and being married but like in in the old i would that was i would always fall back to that like well abraham had a concubine (laughs) This computer's my concubine. Yeah. Like that literally <laughs> was my logic. And it's terrible to think about now. Um, but that was my logic. But mm-hmm. I wish someone would have kind of if I would have and, and I if I would have opened up and said mm-hmm. that's this is my logic. I'm sorry I, I I feel bad every time I do it, but like this is my logic. But if a man would have said to me, you know, well, what about in the New Testament where it talks about not having an affair? Yeah. And nowadays, it's virtual more than physical, obviously. Oh, yeah. Um, a lot more because of how, how accessible it is. And I think I would have sat back and been like, wow, yeah, uh, you know, made me think a little bit. Because obviously, porn is in the Bible. Um, um, if I'm not mistaken, pornea, the word pornea is, which is just about um, uh, a naked woman or a naked image or something around those lines. But like... Thou shalt not look at porn mm-hmm. was not in the Bible, True. but yeah. you can definitely pull it out of there. Oh yeah, in certain 100%. in certain verses and stuff. But again, my old, my fallback was always, well, Abraham had a concubine, <laughs> David had hundreds of concubines, Solomon had. And yeah, why is this man alive, dude? Yeah, he fell to women, so Still I can fall a couple times and ask for forgiveness. And of course, that wasn't my mindset starting out, but after viewing it, that would be my mindset. Yep. But now, I, 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 you know, coming out of it, I kind of I see it from a whole new light. And just wish I would have opened up to someone. Um, and, and again, like I would, I could have easily opened up to my dad, but just the, sh- the shame. Mm-hmm. My mom, of course, but the shame there. And eventually, my wife. And and honestly, what kind of started it was she found stuff on my phone, and but started that. Pro- but there wasn't really any real, real close guys in my life at that time that I felt I could open up with and not have shame. Yeah. Knowing what I know now, I feel like if I would have opened up. Um, and I've actually have talked to a couple of guys since then, and three or four of the guys that I was probably comfortable enough opening up with uh, were struggling with it at the yeah. time or had struggles. So I'm yeah. like, 
man, if I would have just opened up and, you know, took a guy out to coffee mm-hmm. and just said, hey, this is what I'm dealing with or help make me pray with me. And they probably would have opened up and been like, oh, yeah, that was me two years ago. I'm like, yep. oh, my word, that would have been. So I think the devil puts us in that 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 shell and puts us in that and in, in shame. Um, but then also the, the, the mindset of like I was saying with the concubines, like there's always there's always several ways to look at it from the person struggling with it, whether I don't want to open because up because of the shame, but I'm justifying it because yeah, of this. So there's, there's a factor. wall on both sides. I don't want to go here because of the shame, but yet I'm justifying it because of this. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think as, as us as men open up and of course it has to be the right environment, the right For place. Sure. But um, And there and very much someone you trust. Yes. Like obviously For sure. We've kind of been joking a little bit, but it's like that is a serious matter. Like, obviously, find someone that you trust with that information who's not going to blast it to the world and, and disrespect. Yeah, a very sensitive topic that obviously is hard for you to talk about because it's like, hey, there is some shame attached to that. So, yeah, find someone you 100 percent trust that you can share that with for sure. But I can say to once you share that with whether it's your wife or whoever, and you're past that, the the um, the weight. Literal, literally mm-hmm. weight and and burden is lifted off your shoulder. Yes, there's probably going to be some crying and maybe some yelling and screaming or whatever. Um, I'm just being real with, with anyone who's struggling with it and hasn't opened up. But like, if that's the least that happens or the greatest thing that happens yeah. or the worst thing that happens, put it that way, that is – like get past that it's like minimal a, for like, the damage that will happen i have a friend of mine there. who said he was his wife called him or he opened up to his wife and she said if you ever struggle with it again or if i find you struggle with it again i'm you, we're getting a divorce so that was the weight he yeah. she put on him and he said you know he's he has not or you know if if, if he's ever tempted he talks about yeah but like that is an extreme. Well, yeah. I think it's a good extreme for the men. But like, if the worst you you have is is your wife or your spouse or your mm-hmm. significant other yelling at you, screaming at you, maybe not talking to you for two three days, like as a man, you know, embrace the suck, <laughs> deal with it, and move on and and grow and learn and ask for help, open up, um, because I think uh, us as Christian men and us as a as a nation, you know, we got to get through this because it's it's a epidemic that's just oh, yeah. spread throughout and, and and I'll be honest like I haven't shared this with a lot of people some of the close people I've shared with and I've shared with George a little bit of my struggle um, and the <laughs> one time I shared it with him was because I was doing a service job in this abandoned house that was like a year old a year abandoned or whatever and I opened up the utility room and literally all these porn yeah. DVDs fall down Dang and it's yeah. just pictures yeah. everywhere and I picked one up and I just felt I picked one up to be like, whoa, what is this? And I just in that moment, and Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it, I was just like, no, it's mm-hmm. I've been down this road. It's not worth it. It's not even worth it. look flipping it over, looking yep. at the other picture. So I shoved it in the back, and I put a bunch of DVDs on, and I put like I think it was Willy Wonka on top. <laughs> like I'll just put this. This is a good old chocolate just, factory. And I'm so thankful for the, to the Lord for the strength to do that because. Mm-hmm. Four or five years ago, I wouldn't have been able to. Yeah. I would have opened the thing oh, up. Yeah. I would have flipped through. Well, how many pictures are in here? And honestly, that, that probably, job would have took you 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> that probably would have led to me looking at stuff on uh-huh. my phone that night or that, you know, that evening or whatever. And But, you know, that's just how far the Lord has taken me from as a Christian mm-hmm. Lancaster County boy um, out of. And I'm so thankful for the the strength of the Lord to to say no and to to realize that it's it's just not worth it mm-hmm. and um, you can say no and, and you can fall and fail and there's grace and mercy for, for sure. you in that moment but you know the biggest thing is to turn your turn around the Bible says about um, forgiving someone seventy times seven mm-hmm. that's four hundred ninety times but the Bible also says that the righteous the righteous the righteous, I think it's in Proverbs, lift themselves up or bring themselves up out of the mud. Yeah. And that's the difference between the righteous and the unrighteous. The unrighteous stay down, whereas the righteous will ask for help or will bring mm-hmm. themselves out of the mire and the muck and the mud. Um, I got to look up that. I got to get better with my verses, references. Dude, oh, but, don't, oh, oh, I suck. It's, it's in there somewhere. The Siri but version. Even, honestly, okay, so this is something, and I feel like, so the statistics, and this isn't even like Christian statistics, but like as a whole society, like people are having less sex than ever just because of the whole porn ap- yeah. epidemic and everything. But even just like I love movies, I love TV shows, I love video games. Within all of that, 
and I think like well, you can go into the conspiracy of how Hollywood controls the world and everything like that type deal. But what I will say is the best story shows, movies, and everything have the most sex. Yeah. Game of Game Thrones, of Thrones. <laughs> phenomenal. And now I haven't watched it. No, I, I haven't either. But but like clips even, of it are yeah. all over. And then like everyone says how phenomenal of a show it is, which I would probably agree with if I would watch it. Like I love a good story, and it's like then they just sprinkle that in there. Like The Witcher, which is based off a video game. Yeah, I yeah. have watched that whole series. Horrible. Like so much just filth in it. But it's but it's a phenomenal story. Like even God of War is yeah. God of it's like, yep. It's a, a great video game and it's just littered with it. And it's like all the best stuff and the most compelling story always has the most. And I, I think there is something to say about that where it's just like it is very easy because it is like, okay, it's five or not even five minutes. It, it's it's a minute here, it's a minute there within 40 hours yeah. of whatever your show your video game whatever so you can justify it very easily because you're like dude it's such a good story i can just fast forward this but i think at least for me what it does personally it numbs you to it yeah and then you're fine yeah looking it up later or, or that trigger then takes you down that dark road or, or whatever but it's like all the best like all the best story-driven stuff I've found has just a plethora. And I feel like, honestly, I don't know if this is like a redeeming factor or anything, but like Top Gun Maverick was one of the best movies. It didn't have any of that. And I feel like people just appreciated that. Yeah. And maybe it was just every conservative dude and, and like wife was just happy that something came out that was still a good story. But like, I don't know. Maybe that's a redeeming factor. Like, still hope. I, I don't know. Yeah. No, it's good. I heard... Uh, some reason whatever with you just talking about what you were uh made me think of oh oh i know what it was how it's sprinkled throughout in in stories and video games and movies and that kind of thing and i was thinking of david so david obviously slept with bathsheba mm-hmm. and everything but then if you remember absalom his son slept with his sister-in-law uh that was and, wild stuff yeah so but i heard a, a really good point to this um, and I was just was looking it up because I'm tired of not having references. <laughs> but it's in Second Samuel, um, and I don't necessarily read it, but I just wanted to give a reference. Second Samuel sixteen twenty two. Um, anyway, um, Second Samuel, I believe, is where the story is. Absalom, and I wanted to get the the son's name right. Absalom sleeps with his sister uh, in law, technically, but that's the one where he pretends, if I'm not mistaken, he pretends to be sick. She comes in to take care of him, and then he rapes her. Basically, yeah. sleeps with her. And I heard a a, a, a a pastor share how you don't hear him being reprimanded or or corrected by mm-hmm. David in any way, shape, or form. Why? And the biggest reason why is because he did the same thing. Yeah. And he realizes that, and, and this is where I'm so thankful, and I and I pray I have um, the eyes to see for my son. But David saw his his son Absalom doing the same things mm-hmm. he did, um, and didn't reprimand him for it because he had committed those same things, and and was probably and the, the, the preacher was speculating, but he was probably heartbroken. That he didn't raise his son better. Yeah. That he didn't uh, share the signs or symptoms of what not to do or where, how to turn. And so that's why I pray in learning that from that story and, and the insights in that with my son to, to pass on when he's ready. Um, like you were saying, it's awesome. Like mm-hmm. pornography can be great. Like in the moment, like it is so, f- you know, because everything's at yep. your fingertips. You can see what you want, look up what you want, whatever. But the the reap the the the, the whirlwind you're going to reap, and the heartache and the pain, mm-hmm. and um, I'm saying possibly your salvation. We can get a whole other story there. But just the the testimony that can be ripped from you in mm-hmm. going down that road. Um, it just like with Absalom and, and I don't remember exactly what happened to Absalom at the very end, but like David must have been so torn to see that same sin yeah. come back full. So, I mean, he was still punished. Yep. Uh, David was punished for sleeping with Bathsheba. Um, he lost his, his, the baby. They had the, um, um, 
pestil or uh, yeah plague go through and kill all those people. So he actually you know lost or had two forms of punishment. But the third, and it's not really Bible doesn't say this, but if you think about it, his son doing the same act mm-hmm. he did, and what that how that must have tore tore David up and torn him apart. And I think us as a as a, a Christians and as a nation need to learn from that and say what was his David's problem or, or issue maybe uh, let's assume didn't talk about the mm-hmm. sons wasn't there for his children wasn't yeah. raising them in the fear of the Lord and the way he should have been um, yes he had concubines he was out you know fighting fighting the Philistines and all that kind of thing um, and it goes back to being that hero at home mm-hmm. and you know because you hear different pastors and preachers that go around preaching all the world but then their children are living in and in, in, in sin and, and, and to each their own it, we all have a personal relationship with Christ we can't hold our children to be Christians and, and absolute but just the heartache that David must have felt for his son yeah. and and the fact that he wasn't taught that didn't teach them those warning signs and even Solomon Solomon was David's son and mm-hmm. when he have uh, 600 concubines a thousand concubines yeah. hundreds of concubines at least and he fell to women a so, lot of women you know and you see <clears throat> you see this trend and and um, going off on another little tangent but uh, <laughs> I listened to a podcast uh, the last couple actually last year I guess and it's called um Exorcist Files. Okay. It's dramatized um, exorcisms that, well, basically, back, let me back up. It's a priest that tells his stories, and he has a journal of, of these exorcisms he does, but he goes through the backstory of of um, these folks that come to him and need a, a demon, you know, take, you know, removed from the home or, mm-hmm. or out of their lives. I say all that to say he shares that that um, the devil and demons know us better than we know ourselves. Not only that, demons, to my knowledge and biblically, don't die. We die. They live forever. Um, he shares a story where he was casting out a demon that that claims he he's um, was uh, part of something happened in 1320 or something oh, like that with the Catholic Church. Anyway, some stuff to think about, but. That I say all to say that um, the devil knows our weaknesses and his minions, the demons, know our weaknesses, and um, they try the same thing with every generation over mm-hmm. and over and over again. And we as humans need to smarten up and say, "Hey, you know, um, David fell of this, Solomon, Absalom, or whatever. My dad, I did. I want to save you from this." And and tell you the you know the lessons I've mm-hmm. learned and things to avoid and of course with my dad wouldn't know technology as yeah. as I do but um uh but yeah just things that we need to pass down to our children that that um to save them from that heartache and that pain mm-hmm. and kind of learn from from David and Absalom um and what they what they went through and and how they went through it yep and anyway, that kids, was a long rant. abstinence not Absalom. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just a little joke. For that was stupid. Um, yeah, no, and and that's the thing too. Like even in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. Yep. It's like the sin is still the exact same, just the package it's delivered in has changed a little bit. Yep. And yep. it's just like, yeah, the no, it's it's nothing new. Like the devil has no new tactics. It's yep. all the same stuff, and it works. Um, so yeah, one hundred percent. Why change it <laughs> for him? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's horrible, but true. Um, boy, and yeah, once, but. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that was a, a a long tangent, but a good one. One story that as a victory story is Joseph. Mm-hmm. What, did, what did Potiphar's wife try to seduce him? Yeah. What does he do? Runs away. Runs away. He just turns and runs away. And, That's why and, I'm running that marathon, dude. <laughs> Get away from freaking Potiphar's wife. Correct. correct uh, Bible scholars have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe um, the, the only sin in the Bible— I think I got this right. The only sin in the Bible that that Jesus or the Bible says to flee is is um, um, sexual immorality. It's the only one the Bible says to flee from, to turn and actually run really? from. All others, it's it's abstain or thou shalt not or don't do. But it's the only one that that says to flee, flee. from. Huh. Um, and I believe the the Hebrew is to actually turn your back like Joseph yeah. and run the other direction. Get out of there. Um, anyway, Bible study for another podcast. But yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Hmm. Good stuff. What what do you got on time? Where I have ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. So we got oh, it's ten oh one. No, no, I'm saying <laughs> not, not that I want to know the time. What are you on time? Like what am I on time? Yeah, like 
I'm late. Yeah, like, do you want to wrap this up? That's oh, what I'm no. asking. Oh, okay. I, I'm okay. a bachelor this week. Yeah, we okay, can... dude. Yeah. <laughs> and be in the company my of good wife, men. My wife did FaceTime me, so I'm assuming she's calling to say goodnight. Um, uh, hey, honey, is your podcast over three minutes ago? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you want to take a little break? Give her a text? <laughs> sure. I'll, sure. Get a, I'll get a drink, and then we'll come back to it? Sure. Love it. All right, and we're back after the break. Um, where were we? Refresh my brain. We travel what? down the route. Okay, one more thing just to close out the whole pornography train. I know I said in the beginning where it was like, hey, teaching the kids, hey, be honest about kind of your experience and everything. Also, equally important that you follow up with this, the repercussions that it has. Because it does have serious repercussions um, within your marriage and all those things. And then the downfalls of it. It's that high time. It's that instant gratification. And then realize afterwards the ugliness, the truthfulness of actually what it is and the sin it is. Equally as important. Yeah. So for all of the people listening, like, oh, dude, this guy thinks it's freaking rocking. No. <laughs> you think that in your immaturity, then you get into... The effects, and sometimes it doesn't come out till two years, three years, four years later. The negative repercussions and the sin nature of all that. So, not only that, I'm glad you brought that up, but um, the so with that, and I can't remember the chemical release in your brain that happens, but dopamine, dopamine. Thank you. I was gonna say yeah, dopamine. Um, wasn't gonna say dopamine, but yeah, that's what it is. So with and I can test to this because that's where it was, was it started with something little, a picture, a video, real simple. That was the dopamine release would happen. Um, and then the, the pictures had to be more intense. The mm -hmm. videos had to be longer. The video. Anyway, I say a lot to say that um, um, the same pastor I listened to about those the counseling session and the questions he had shares. And it's really a testament to where our nation is that it gets to the point where it's not um, – it's not only women, then it has to be men and women, then mm -hmm. it has to be children. And America, and uh, since uh, Sound of Freedom, this is a pretty common statistic, at least I've heard it a couple of times. Um, America is the number one consumer of child pornography. Mm -hmm. And and this pastor uh, that I listened to, his name's I just uh, Chris Swanson of uh, um, Calvary Chapel, Chester Springs, he, he has... Um, Count, counseled or, or, or heard of counselings, something along the lines of, of boys, um, young men, 20, 21, looking at, at things and literally not being able to be intimate with them. They're getting married and not being able to be intimate with their 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 spouse having, and Viagra doesn't do it. Like, yeah. it, it gets to the point where even stuff with their wife, the, having intimacy with their wife isn't isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. and isn't So it's a whole, and I, that's why I called it a, a, an epidemic because it's an untalked about, undiscussed epidemic that is, is um, it's completely under the radar if it's not discussed, yeah. obviously. But um, just the fact that it it takes more and more and, and greater and greater mm -hmm. um, portions of it, different aspects of it. Um, you know, and you can just go down a whole more rapid trails with that. But that's it should be uh, eye opening, um, frightening. I guess should be the word. Yeah, for uh, sure. For Americans and on our society and our environment to to be a, a, alerted to that and um, eyes to be open to um, the the repercussions of it. And that, what you said, repercussions, that made me think of it, that mm -hmm. it's it's not just what it can do to your marriage, but what it can do you, to you physically mm -hmm. and what you need to view or look or consume to to um, to excite you. Yeah. And yeah, it's 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 a, a dark, um, dark path for sure. And um, uh a path that this country is on, unfortunately. Oh. But yeah, anyway. My mom always used to say, and I would get so pissed at her for saying it because I thought it was stupid back in the day. As you get older, you will realize your parents were a little wiser than you'd like to admit. But she would always say, it'll take you farther than you want to go and it'll keep you for longer than you want to stay. Yeah, I've and heard that. I was that, like, yeah. oh, shut up. I'm going to go drink or whatever I was stupid thing I was going to get into. And then you get older and you realize nuts. 
She was right. right. <laughs> but yeah. Anywho, wrapping up kind of that session on that um, phenomenal session. Glad we didn't expect to go there, but I'm glad we did. Yeah, sorry. Um, you're you're new to me. A very lighthearted podcast. Yeah, no, we we, here, like, we went to the depths, baby. <laughs> Started battling Belzebub down there, dude. Holy! Well, some of the best podcasts are just the honest ones, you know. That's and, right, and, that's and I don't we... know what made me share. You asked, oh, that's right. You asked about was there any? Uh, you said financial, or dark like, times, yeah, dark times, or like regrets for mm-hmm. running the business. And I don't know. I mean, I believe God's in everything, but yeah, it's just the Lord put that on my yeah. heart to share, my mind to Absolutely. share, and I was like. You know, I, I'm going to share it. But yeah. And that's why I like not planning out episodes. Like, I don't plan any of this. Like, nothing's scripted. I no, don't... that's not, not true. Fourth of July, you had those. Fourth of July, we had the rompers. No. Oh, yeah, it's true. True. You had the rompers, but no, you had the questions for true. your buddy of like how many fireworks. Yeah, that was, many... uh, that's about the maximum amount of effort <laughs> and right. research I put into it. I Google searched something three minutes before he showed up. <laughs> Generally for the episodes, yeah, it's just kind of whatever we want to talk about, whatever we feel, whatever the good Lord leads. Yep. Um, yep. So dark times in business, equating to dark times within the life, um, and then kind of going through the business, getting to a point of, let's say, well, okay, so Alex Hermosi says this thing, and I'm sure I said it on here before, he says, and I can fully attest to this, starting something... You have he, – he, he makes it like a circle. And he said you have uninformed optimism when you start something. So like with you, with your business or me, with this podcast, like, like okay, hey, what a great idea. Like I should start a podcast. There's only upsides. There's no downsides. You get to talk to people. It's fun. Like you have all these things, yada, yada. You'll be rich. You'll be merry. You'll be happy. And then he says after you start – and you continue down that path, you come to a place called informed pessimism. And he's like, that's when you start to realize, oh, this isn't as easy as I thought. There was some things where it's like, not exactly what I expected. It's a little harder than I expected. And then he said, there's a thing called the pit of despair. And he's like, that's where pretty much everyone gives up. Mm. And he says, that's like when you're down in it and just like, dude, I'm done. And then what happens is you start your new thing and you go through that cycle and you go through that cycle and you continuously give up. But he said, if you can get through the pit of despair, then at some point you become after you do the thing and you do the thing and you get better at it and you get better at it. Because obviously when you start something new, you suck at it. Like that's just how it is. Like generally even like uh, Ed Sheeran, which is like a super good musically like right, songwriter right. phenomenal he said he's like there is no such thing as born talent and he plays a clip of him when he was younger and like atrocious and he said but at some point like you just put in that much work that you suck less and you suck less and then you finally realize you're good and he says and then at that point going back to alex Ramosi, you get to the point where it's informed optimism when you realize you're good and then like you can you can then succeed, and then he's like, and then something else comes up within your business or whatever you started, and you just go through that cycle again, and then it's the pit of despair, informed optimism type deal. Um, so within that, now we went through kind of the pit, the lows. What was the highs? Like, was there a point where it's like, like my work has paid off? Or it, was there a point like that? Was there a specific time where you're like, okay, yeah, hey, maybe like the past eight years or or whatever it was for you, like, yeah, it was worth it. That that sacrifice or whatever, it was worth it. Did you have a point like that? Was there was there a pivotal moment or anything like that? I wouldn't say a pivotal moment. Kind of going back to uh, husbands and providers, I felt, well, my wife, when she was able to quit her job mm-hmm. and, and be a mom, like that was a... a, 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 a accomplishment on my yeah. f- on my mind because I always wanted that for my wife if she didn't want ha- want to work she didn't have to mm-hmm. so I felt like that was awesome I was so glad she was able to do that financially we were able to to stay afloat and, and do that um and then providing work for others that was always something that I, I enjoyed doing and then that's that 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 prevents or um that has its own 
weight and burden of itself because oh, yeah. it's like, oh, now other families, other households depend on you providing mm-hmm. work or you doing a good job or you estimating well, whatever the case is. Um, but that was cool to have my own business, uh, something I started from scratch. That was that was always great. And there's always those those times where it's like, I want to I want to you know blow this out of the water and grow real big and and grow fast or whatever. Yeah. But then that has its own you know um, <laughs> set of circumstances and set of and challenges and stuff. Um, and and I kind of did that. I did kind of blow not blow up. I hired like three guys in one year, if I'm not mistaken. From and, and it was just me in the office. So I was stressed, and that was probably the time of the low with with pornography. Um, I was stressed out the wazoo. I had all these all these estimates to go, all these jobs to go. No one else in the office to help with it. So it was all on me. Mm-hmm. And I, I like to say office is office work is for our kind of business is the grease to keep the gears going. Yep. If you stop estimating, you stop invoicing the boat. You know the work stops. You stop doing the work, and then the the finance or the the financial in input the the money starts cu- coming in you can't pay your workers yep. it's all one big wheel that the grease has to keep moving so but back to your question um i can't say i ex- there was a, a particular high um in in my business i know in 2019 i downsized and and we got rid of all employees uh which i had two full-time uh two i'm sorry four full-time and then five full-time Five, no, four full time, one part time. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> what business am I talking about here? No, um, and then at, we had two guys give their two weeks within a month of each other, um, and then I basically, my wife and I, my wife and I talked about it, prayed about it, and we decided to just downsize. At that point, my son was two and a half, three years old, so downsize to just me, and that was really. Um, fun and um, I kind of felt like semi-retired because it was like no one then depended on me other than my family I had tons of work Um, I could literally say no to stuff I didn't want or knew I couldn't get to or just didn't it was whatever too big for me Um, I didn't have um, guys that that I knew like didn't enjoy that kind of work I just was like if I don't enjoy it I don't have to do it or whatever Um, so that was really cool that was three or three and a half years of that um and then uh yeah and then george approached me in um august september august august of 2023 about joining the team and Mm -hmm. gh and stuff and then um, my wife and i prayed about it thought about it and um yeah decided to, to go down that road and and that's been awesome i really really glad um we joined gh and the team behind, um, behind, not behind me, but the, the team that I work with now, it's much more of a team effort and mm-hmm. there's people around. It's not just me. All the weight isn't on my shoulders um, to get stuff done. Uh, you know, we can kind of distribute the burden or the, the um, responsibility. Yep. So that's been huge. Um, and, and that was a, that was a, that was a high. If I had to, if I had to boil it down, yeah, that would say I would definitely a high when he when he approached me and and you know the fact that I I made an imprint um to you guys and to him like hey this is a company we could do well mm-hmm. you know bring it on board or bring him out on board to run the manage the service department um and that's what I enjoy so it was a win win for me I felt like I wasn't like he was bringing me on to help with all the different yeah. departments obviously we 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 spread ourselves out when we have to but if I can do what I enjoy and not much changes on my end as far as from the customer spam standpoint to me um that'd be great and then if i have help on the back end with phone calls scheduling that's great too um and someone who's quick better at it faster and at, at it that's great so yeah it, that was probably a pretty pretty pip, uh, pivotal point and mm-hmm. high point um and then right now I, mean, I feel like i'm still we're still riding that high and the growth and and expansion moving the shop like mm-hmm. all of that is just i told george this that you know um it's all it's a growth period the business is in um a stepping stones of of building um becoming you know more well known putting yep. on community days like that's all part of it and you know i i i feel like not to be too ambitious and want to grow too fast because I feel then then the foundation isn't very thick or very big, yeah. but laying a really good foundation, establishing, um, you know, managers and that kind mm-hmm. of thing, that's going to be so important to then bringing on new um, employees yep. to, to, you know, build, stand on those managers and that foundation that's built. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's something too, even like, even with this podcast and everything, like the desire of 
I'm going to say fame. I use that term loosely, though, like the desire to grow at a rapid rate. So like and I think what happens in and like even with your business and now with with George as well, like it generally a healthy business. And I could be totally wrong in this because I don't know business, but like you have kind of your like the first couple of years, it's very slow and kind of you peak up. And then at some point it seems like everything just clicks and then you really start ramping up. Um, but I feel like even now, like with the instant gratification and everything, it's like, there's always hacks. Like everyone's got a hack. Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, do this hack and you'll, you'll blow up. But it's like, no, if you just consistently, and like, I struggle with this because it's like, I fall trapped to that crap all the time, even though I know it's like, Garbage. Like, I'll still fall to it. Be like, oh, yeah, maybe I should do this hack and get, like, 20,000. But it's like, no, if you just consistently put out a good product or and, like, get better from every... Like, for me, it's just the goal, like, hey, no matter how many views you get, no matter how many whatever, followers, subscribers, whatever you have, each video, there's something better than the last one. Like, maybe your lighting's better. Maybe your the production quality, the editing's better. Your speaking's better, your cadence, whatever it is, get a little bit better each video and the growth will come. And I feel like even with you coming on board with kind of us with community days, like that was a, I would say that was a monumentous event for us. Like that was insane. That was so cool to see. Uh, I loved just how everyone kind of came together and, and put that on. But it's like in in that and, and George and you do a very good job of casting the vision of like, no, it's not about it's not about how fast we can grow. It's about doing a phenomenal job and the growth will come. Like even with community days, it it was never like, let's promote this. So like we can, it's like, no, Hey, how can we help out these people? How can we help out these people? How can everyone that comes to this event gather or gain, um, like gain a benefit from it? Um, and yeah, that, that even for me, just being a little bit farther back in life than you or not as far along as you and, and, and George, it's like, that's even a good stepping stone for even me doing this. Like, no, like you don't need the hack. Like you don't need a hundred thousand subscribers tomorrow. You just need to get better than you were yesterday. Yeah. And like, as long as you're slowly doing that, like, yes, it will be slow and it will be probably three, four, five years of no one really listening and like that. And then like, it's just like putting in that work like everyone and now yes obviously with like where technology is like you can blow up overnight um but then that comes with its whole different things and it's like do you actually really want that like yeah and i I don't think growth is a bad thing like even with your business and and then where uh gh was maybe three years ago we were like hey we don't want to grow like we our profit margins are pretty good the headaches are minimal let's just stay here but growth is natural in in a living organism and it's like if you are a living healthy organism you're going to grow so then it's like okay how do we grow in a healthy pace maybe or a healthy a healthy manner um because yeah growth can look differently you can get 20 more guys in one year and that's still a healthy growth dependent on if you have the right systems in place and everything um but in saying all that jargon with coming on board, now we're getting into the juicy stuff um, <laughs> with coming on board to GH, you having a business of your own for 10 plus years and then stepping into another business. What does that because e- even for me, I'm a very laid back person until it comes into something like art or something and like something I'm very good at that someone tries to help me with it's like dude piss off like I have this you're gonna you're not gonna do it to the quality I want and all that so from my experience like I just know there would be things in my life where it's like that would be a trick tricky a tricky path to walk and I know me and you have obviously already talked about some of the stuff within the office like where it's like oh yeah hey like no, obviously it's going to be like hard for you and hard for me to come to a certain point on this because you have been doing it on your own and and you built something to a level that was like very proficient and now we also built something and then like merging those two, like what is that experience like 
for you? Because I personally haven't experienced anything where I've built and then had to merge it with something else. Like, yeah. it, obviously, it's tricky. I think it's going well, and I think as long as you have open lines of communication, it does. But like for you, what's the? Is there one thing that's like that's it's like tricky or weird? I would say really the only thing that's kind of been weird is not knowing, and this is kind of something you and I shared a little bit, well, like with emails, CCing Mm -hmm. me in on them and the response to customers with estimates, but like not knowing when a job is complete or an estimate is Mm -hmm. completed or a phone call is returned all the time. I mean, generally I am made aware like, hey, I call them back or Mm -hmm. I emailed over a text, but like there's some that hit me like, oh, wait, I haven't heard... Did we actually get back to them? Mm-hmm. And I had one customer say, like, and it was kind of a compliment, but also triggered them to, to saying something wasn't quite right, where I didn't, they didn't get a call back within 24 mm-hmm. hours or something. And they were like, Matt, that, that's not Matt. So something, yeah. either he didn't get the message or the office didn't get the message or whatever. So I'm going to call or text back mm-hmm. or email back. Um, so that's, and, and and I, and I know it's just a matter of me letting go of certain aspects of the business, but then other aspects is I want us to be a quick response, mm-hmm. quick response within 24 hours, yeah. whether it's text, email, you know, for some people, maybe that's a long response, but that was always my standard mm-hmm. with life flow. Um, but yeah, that's just been a transition of me just saying, or not knowing when that response happens, but trusting mm-hmm. that it's happening at yeah. a certain time. And if it bugs me and I can't, think otherwise then i'll just text or email yep. someone in the office say hey do we get back to this person mm-hmm. or let them know but i also want, don't want to be a helicopter uh, owner either helicopter parenting or you know hovering and, and saying you have to text them back now yep. or did you text them back because that that gets super annoying as well um but i would say that's probably the biggest hurdle that i've kind of had to overcome yeah and i'm not over overcame it fully yet but just um understanding that hey if it is that big of a deal because I guess I've been burnt so many times with customers not using me with mm-hmm. LifeFlow because I didn't get back yeah. in a timely manner, or <clears throat> I sent them an email and b- via email. I'm sorry, sent them an estimate via email and they never got it because it went to yep. spam. And then I find out two weeks later they went with someone else. What my what it went with me, but I didn't email them back, so they thought I wasn't interested. I'm like, oh, so that and, and I'm kind of um, a person that like I once if I learn if something hits me hard the first time i will try to always so like for example if i send an email to a customer it goes to spam and i really wanted that mm-hmm. job like every time after that in my mind i will always text and be like hey did you get yeah. the email did you get the email even though the customer like i think about this afterwards like the customer i have emailed and i have emailed before but i'm still I still will send the estimate and text them to make sure they got the email. But I'm like, I know, I know I got a good email. I know. Yeah. Get but just like mm-hmm. uh, whatever you want to call it, the anxiety of them possibly not getting it drives me nuts. So I want to make sure they get it. Um, anyway, so that's just something that um, I've been learning to, to let go. And, and, you know, if it's that big a deal or if it's meant to happen, it will happen. Mm-hmm. Or if it's that big a deal, the customer will reach back out yep. to us and ask for it. So. That's probably about it. That's about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's like, not that, in some ways it overlaps, but like, even just with what you're saying and like, the two, two people or two different companies, obviously more than just two people are involved, but have built something up to a standard or a practice and then marrying those two together, it's almost like a marriage. Yeah. Like where it's like, you have been raised for 20 years or whatever, how long you have it's been before you get married. And this other person has been raised. And it's like you have those differences where it's like, OK, now we need to just figure out, like, how do we marry these two? What is important? Like, because you also don't realize. And I, I not just ripping on my family. I'm saying all families across the world how weird your family is until you get someone else in like that close proximity with you. It's like, Oh no, this is normal. No, it's freaking not. What are you saying? Like (laughs) there's been so many instances where it's either. Yeah. My wife says that to me or I say that to her. It's like, no, like this is, this is not what other people do. And it's just like that, that open communication of, and it's, it's that weird, like, okay. So like, is what you're saying because obviously you want to respect you want to love the other person and it's like is this actually important well, how important is it there's definitely like 
levels to grade all that stuff in. Um, and it's just, yeah, that that communication and that constant tweaking of like, okay, hey, micro adjustment here. Uh, maybe we correct it too far, bring it back a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I, I honestly feel like when two businesses merge, it is like a legitimate, not a, not a marriage, but like there is definitely overlaps of that where it's like, because for you, yeah, you've built something that has flourished for 10 years. You have all your own systems. And then it's like, and you at the end were like totally by yourself. So it's like you had control over every aspect when coming to a business where it's like George was there, then he relinquished control um, in certain aspects of the business. And then it's like you, you, you guys kind of went through the exact same transition. Just you hit it all at once. Where him, he slowly worked out of it, and that was really hard for him. And then it's like you came in, and it's like, dude, you had to deal with that in a snap of a finger, and like, oh shoot, like let's, uh, okay, let's talk about this. So yeah, I understand that would be crazy in certain aspects. And that's what our our attorney actually told us, like when we were signing the final documents, paperwork was. He's like, well, basically, this is. A marriage, like mm-hmm. he tells all. Or I believe he said he tells all business mergers or um, yeah, operation agreement is what we were signing. But he tells all of them that yeah, this is essentially a marriage. There's the legal or um, literally the uh, marriage license is similar. There's some similar wordings. Oh, really? some, yeah, it's it's kind of similar in that you know you're agreeing that if you take if if you have a disagreement to a certain extent, you're willing to settle outside of court. But if it leads to court, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so he was like. You know that has to be a good a good um, merger of of ideas. Mm-hmm. You have to be you know similar um, business models, which you know George and I both do. Mm-hmm. We both um, um, debt free run a business yep. debt free as much as possible. Um, very similar um, standards for work. Um, we we have similar tools. Like it just mm-hmm. kind of goes down the spectrum uh, of a lot. Run a lot of stuff similar. You know I trust him. He trusts mm-hmm. me. Um, and it can even go back to our upbringing. You know, we were raised kind of more conservative um, and in the Lancaster County area. Anyway, so you can go on and on and on and on. Um, and it, it really was a good uh, – and I was actually at a point – I think I told George this – like June, June, probably like May, June of, of 2023, I was kind of like, all right, God, like I've been running this by my – life flow by myself mm-hmm. for three years now. Like what's the next thing? Like do mm-hmm. I hire people? I've, I've been down that road and I can do it all over again. I think I think I would do it differently or kind of have different standards uh, for people that I would hire. But like, what's my neck? And so that was kind of like a prayer of mine and, and like I call it like a back burner prayer. Yeah. Like what's the next move? What's the next move? Probably, yeah, May, June, July, and then August, the end of August, George approached me. I'm like, yeah, this mm-hmm. is the next move. And then mm-hmm. I had multiple people come to me come to me about um buying my business or becoming partners or just liquidating mm-hmm. it and becoming a, an employee but none of that really interests me yeah um and then and i never thought thought george or or anything like that and then when he approached me i was like yeah this is like a no-brainer for mm-hmm. me and i think it'd be pretty natural and how it would be go together um anyway so yeah it was really really neat how the lord worked mm-hmm. that all together and and um but yeah it's it's really a merger and they say you know um best friends sometimes make the best partners because mm-hmm. they're they're you know same similar mindset or they can be similar mindset um i know um my brother-in-law him and his best friend went in business together doing chiropractic work oh yeah and um yeah they were roommate they started as roommates in the same school and then did chiropractic school and then ended up going on their own but like they're like brothers i mean they, they both don't have brothers if i'm not mistaken i know the one my brother my wife's brother-in-law doesn't but i don't know if the other anyway um but they're like brothers and they talk about everything they're, they live two house two mm-hmm. doors down from each other and they you know they go through um Got close to everything band name right yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so anyway um but yeah similar mindset similar upbringing all that is is huge um in in merging businesses and obviously different personalities For sure. and that's that's always good too as long as those personalities don't clank heads all the time i think um kind of our iron sharpening iron the sparks are going to fly oh, yeah. but as long as in the end oh, you get yeah. a better product or a better business model or whatever that's what that's what matters so 
Yeah, better outcome. Yeah. Exactly. And that's something, too, which, like, I was talking to George about. He's like, in just talking with him with the partnership and everything, he's like, you don't want someone that's good at the exact same thing you're good at. Yeah. Because he's like, then you will clank heads because you think you're the best and they think they're the best and because you're both very good at this one thing. And he's like, you want people where it's like you you con- you compliment um, where it's, hey, you're good at this and I'm good at this and it, it pairs well with each other. And that made a lot of sense to me. I was like, oh, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I can understand that. Um, no, I, I, I'm stoked. I think I think, yeah. Even with where the business is, it's in that upward trend right now. And yeah, with Community Days, that was an absolute highlight. That was so cool. And just being able to put that on and realizing, because even talking with George about it a little bit, he was like, plumbing is like the most unflattering job you can do. (laughs) It's gross most of the time. Generally, even if you're in a nice house, you're not in a nice part of the house. Like you're in a crawl space or you're in the basement and it's dirty and it's mucky. And it's like, even at doing that, you can still, like there's still more. Yeah. Like it's not just that task. Right. Um, and even with putting that on, it was just like, even through plumbing, like not that it's the coolest event locally, but it's a freaking coolest event locally. <laughs> like and, and you can still do that even though... I don't know. That just, I don't know if it fried me up. Like I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. So I really enjoyed that. Um, yeah. And now, and how many other companies are doing anything like yeah. that? You know, it's like job fair. Sure. That kind of thing. Or, um, you know, uh, a fair ground where the, the vendors come to the fair, but an actual company putting on a community event for the community, mm-hmm. for a community to participate in. And that's where I was on Monday's meeting. I was saying about like halfway through the day, I was trying to sell people water heaters, mm-hmm. but I'm like, no, like I don't mind selling a water heater, but that shouldn't be my push. This yeah. is a day for our customers. Mm-hmm. Appreciate them. Thank, you know, thank them, put this all on for them. And, you know, they're already our customers. So if they need a water here, they're going to call yeah. us educating them. And that's kind of I shifted from trying to sell to I'm just going to educate on yep. this is a product that's available, mm-hmm. um, a water that's available. This is what your water heater looks like inside. Like, um, And even for, for plumbers, like the, there was a um, – he wasn't a plumber, but he was a builder uh, there that was there, and he never seen an inside of a water heater, really? and it blew him away. Like, oh wow, like what's this? And anyway, so I was able to educate him on it, and he's actually one that wants us to service his water heater and nice. do annual maintenance. So it's perfect. That's exactly why I had that there. But yeah, halfway through the day, it was like, no, this this day is more for the customers. A thank you for them, giving back to mm-hmm. them, um, and uh, appreciating them. So yeah. I think, yeah, I, I've heard all good things. I don't I haven't heard any negative from anybody yet on on the day and how it went. Nope. So I was super stoked about Perfect that. event. <laughs> um, in that, just one question, I guess, came to my mind. Like, what was the thing, and I know you kind of touched on it a little bit, that like, in the process and the prayer of joining GH and merging with them, was there something where it's like, okay, like, like what made that appealing? What made you even want to do that? Because I know you said, and I know like work ethic and, and the similar upbringing, um, but there's, like you said, there's been other businesses that have approached you and like that wasn't even a thought. So why GH? I guess I'd say the, probably the biggest thing was um, I felt like we were on like you just said a similar trajectory mm-hmm. a similar um, path smaller company a lot of the companies that approached me one either wanted to buy me out and be a, um, a franchise me to be a franchise or buy me out and just have absolutely no say in the business so you, buy me buy out and rights. I'd be an employee yeah. so no say no and when George approached me as being a partner um, and, and, you know, running, building this together, I obviously I saw it as, as an opportunity to grow as a business investment opportunity. So like a business mindset mm-hmm. of growing and in, investing in the, in the company, bringing money forward, but then also that growing into something pretty immediately, like within the next 12 months, six months growing into a, a larger monetary value yeah. than when I started, we started. Um, and obviously that's not my full 100% goal or the end goal but it's part of it For sure. and, and obviously For sure. um, uh, a good business move um, 
And yeah, so I kind of felt like it was uh, GH was at a growth period, um, and and a, uh, a a similar like I say trajectory and similar place that I was, and out and I, you know, working with everyone um, on a pretty regular basis, jobs back and forth, communicating on the phone. I felt like it was a, a pretty seamless, somewhat seamless move to do that. So. Um, and everyone else, like I said, was just like, oh, we'll buy you out or we'll throw customers your way or, you know, you're, you you won't have any say because you'll just be an employee here yeah. or that kind of thing. So, Did you have any, like, super appealing financial offers where it's like, dang, that'd be sweet. No. But then it's like almost selling your soul type deal. Yeah, no, I never pursued it. It was an email or I had one guy called me. And an email, and I honestly just kind of shot it down pretty quick. Yeah. I was like, "No, I'm not interested," or "No, thank you." Um, the one guy that called me was the franchise it was Rabbit Rabbit Rooter, oh, not yeah, Rotor yeah. Rooter. It was like Rabbit, Rabbit something. Yeah, I forget um, what their name is. They and and they were trying to start and moving up the East Coast. They have a couple of locations. I think one in Harrisburg or Reading, and they wanted one in Lancaster. And he honestly, he's like, "I Googled you and saw that you're uh, really good uh, Google reviews. Mm. So like, we want to work with companies that are reputable. So yep. you know, where are you at? What kind of numbers do you do? How many employees?" And I was like, "Oh, it's just me." He's like, "Just <laughs> you?" He's like, "Oh, you're running a business?" Like, so yeah, it's just me. Anyway, um, and then I shot it down because again, it was a franchise. I would literally be bought out by them and then oh pay them franchise uh fees franchise oh membership. no way but yeah you pay and really almost any franchise you see rotor rooter mm-hmm. you know subway mcdonald's they all pay so much of their i think i'm not sure exactly what it is it might be like 10 12 percent of earnings weekly monthly daily go to the franchise like the corporate. corporate yeah Dang. so that's part of it and again my name life would be completely Aged out, yeah, and I wouldn't. And you, even as a franchise, you don't have a lot of um, 100% say. You can try to, you know, say I want to move this way or buy this vehicle, whatever. But as far as I understand, a lot of it still has to go to corporate, go to to corporate approval. To so it's like having a boss. Yeah. So it didn't appeal to me at all. But I was thankful for the gentleman to call me and to to give me the um, one thing he did say was, well, every customer you don't get. He's going to your competitor, and he said, "If you're not growing, you're dying." And I'm like, "Well, I'm I'm like sustaining. <laughs> like I don't think I'm dying as a company, mm-hmm. as a business. I'm kind of more sustaining." But anyway, he was yeah. That was just one comment he had that kind of stuck with me. Mm-hmm. And then when George approached me, I'm like, "Well, there's a good opportunity to grow." And I kind of felt Get wrecked, too, rabbit rooter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I kind of felt <laughs> like with where I was at life flow was a standstill. And like I said, it was just that jump to hire again. Um, but then again, it was just me in the yeah. office. So I really felt I was at a rock and a hard place. Um, and then, like I said, when George approached me, it was like, okay, this is great. I can grow or I can help a business grow, yeah. be a, a, a good key player in the business, have some say in the business and yeah, you know, go from there. So yeah, nice. that's, that's really what appealed to me. Sweet. Well, we are honestly, Almost approaching 11 o'clock, so I want to go let you get to bed. <laughs> um, one last thing, which I just thought of. Would you, as someone that has went through the ranks of grunt man to then journeyman's master plumber, now owning your own business to a partner of a larger business, would you say in today's society, even with the... I guess, pu- not push, but the emphasis more on the tech, on the influencer, maybe lifestyle, the the white collar jobs. Would you still say blue collar trade work for younger kids would be like a super viable option? Yes. And uh, it's funny you bring that up because I've been kind of saying this little spiel the last probably year. Um I actually haven't been there for a while, but I am a part of um, OAC, which is Occupational Awareness Co- OAC, yeah, OAC Occ- Occupational Awareness Committee for Votech for CTC. Okay, yeah. And basically, we, we a team of professionals, business owners, uh, plumbers get together. And there's 10, 10, 12 of us. We go in um, twice a year to Votech, and we look over what the guys are learning, guys or girls are learning, and and kind of give our input. So I kind of see where the um, cl- like we talk to the teacher, how many students, whatever. I put it in pers- to put in perspective when I was there at CTC in twenty nine to twenty two uh, thousand nine twenty oh nine two thousand nine. There was twenty two students 
with a waiting list, one teacher. And that was pretty much across the board, masonry, framing, uh, carpentry. Um, the last time I was at the occupational committee, there was there's one teacher, 12, 10 to 12 students, no waiting list. Really? To my knowledge, no waiting list. And that is across the board for most HVAC, trade, um, masonry, jobs. trade. Um, and, and maybe things have changed a little bit, but the, the last time I was there, and it was about a year, year and a half ago now, um, I'm hoping to get to this fall's meeting. But um, but now then you look at um, CAD drawing, um, you know, drafting, that kind of thing. Two teachers, 40 students. Yeah. So there's a push there. Um, not only that, but the baby boomer generation, which is the second largest to, is it generation? The millennials is like the next biggest one, I think, or something along those lines. Anyway, baby boomers, boomers are starting to retire. Yep. 55, 60 year olds. So you have um, a, a, a high demand job with a lot of baby boomers in the, in that industry, plumbing, mm-hmm. HVAC, um, electrical, starting to retire. And then you have you know, supply and demand. You have a less supply coming in. Yeah. So I told a customer the other day, I was like, I predict in 10 years, you're going to have plumbers, kind of your blue collar um, workers making as much as doctors today in 10 years. Yeah. Because the demand. Demand will be people so People aren't high. getting in, uh, young, young people aren't getting into it. And now maybe more will as the money increases and it's like, wow, you can make a lot of money or, you know, charge a lot or whatever. Mm-hmm. Maybe the dynamic will change in a couple of years. For sure. But for what I'm seeing, um, and my prediction is, yeah, you can make some really, really good money in the next couple of years, even as a laborer or journeyman plumber in this industry, because mm-hmm. um, more and more, like I said, more and more companies are going out of business, retiring, whatever. So that like, gives growth for smaller businesses yep. or bigger businesses to buy out those smaller businesses. But yeah, I, I predict that um, the income for, for your blue collar worker, your your labor um, uh, layman will be greatly increased in the next 10 years yep interesting well then i'm due for a pay raise people (laughs) you heard it from the boss so i'll be looking for that in the next check awesome um honestly that's a ton of time i super appreciate you coming on matt for the first guest speaker i guess guest i don't know i don't know what it is we'll figure it out um ricky rudd we literally went like three hours so that's insane um didn't feel like three hours, though. It's, no. Time flies when you're having fun. And you're talking about freaking plumbing, dude. So, <laughs> Ricky Rudd, thank you, Matt. For everyone on here, it's on Apple. It's on Spotify. It's on YouTube. Uh, listen to it wherever you listen to it. If you want to like and subscribe, do that. If you want to sponsor, just sponsor. Just start throwing money. Merch. It, you have merch. I think you have merch. Right yes. Now. Well, we should do. We should do another giveaway. Um, put in the comments if you want to do another giveaway. We'll start giving away some more free merch. I should make hats though. I have a sweet hat person. So if you want new hats and everything, let me know, and we'll start giving those suckers away as well. So thank you everyone for listening, and peace out, Girl Scout. <laughs>